Welcome to the Krug Show, everybody. Hope everybody's having a great Thursday. It is October the 26th, 2023, 702 on the West Coast and 02 on the East Coast. Welcome to the big show, as I like to refer to uh, when it's the three of us together. Vish is back with Beard from Vacation. Jesse is back with the really nice looking neon in the background, which I'm very jealous of. And I am back from camp amidst a lot of traffic, and I've made dinner for the kids. And now it is time to get the big show rolling. Good to see you guys. How you guys doing? Doing good, man. Happy to be here. Excited to see Vish back. He is done with his strike, apparently, when it comes to your channel. So <laughs> good on you, Vish. Well, I, I'm sorry, Krug. Sometimes when port when you got to go to Puerto Rico and you got to go to Cabo, it takes a little bit of precedence over the uh, Krug show. But I'm back for a little bit of pig in a pickle. I'm d- back for New York Sausage Company. I'm back for it all. There you go. That's right. We are brought to you by Pig in a Pickle, the best barbecue in Northern California. Check them out in Emeryville and Corte Madera. Also, Marin Auto Glass. Dot com is our sponsor and New York style Italian sausage, not to mention underdog fantasy. And tonight I I titled the stream. Are you in or are you out on Brock Purdy? And that's kind of the question that the 49ers face, because two days ago, I thought the 49ers were in with Brock Purdy against the Bengals. Yesterday, I kind of assumed that the 49ers were out with Brock Purdy. Uh, up for Sunday with the get with the Bengals today, though, Brock Purdy practiced. And so maybe they are in with Brock Purdy on Sunday. Um, I'm not sure who's in and who's out. I talked to both Brock Purdy and, and Sam Darnold today briefly in the locker room. Sam said, you know, I said, Sam, you got time to talk. He's like, oh, I think I'm talking at the podium tomorrow. So generally that is a spot reserved for the starting for the start. quarterback. But, um, you know, Purdy uh, called me sir today. Oh, my God. I'm like, what's up, man? He's like, hey, what's going on, sir? I'm like, sir, <laughs> sir, what the heck? I know I know it's I, it's mostly pepper, mostly salt, my salt and pepper, but sir. Um, anyway, but uh, he um, he's practicing today and he may be in line to play on Sunday. And one, why don't we start right there? I mean. How do you think it's going to go? What's your guys' prediction? Is Nobody has been in the concussion protocol and then played the next week since Kenny Pickett a year ago. Um, is And they've changed the protocol, and I don't ask me what they've changed about it, but I believe it's a little bit more involved than it was last year and a little bit more difficult to escape um, the protocol and get back on the field. And this is all. And then you mix in the fact that it's a short week for the Niners. There's days involved and testing involved and field work involved. But the fact that he was out there today makes me think that he's at least gearing up to play. Uh, what do you think? Who, who are we going to see Sunday? Does it matter to you guys? Does it matter to um, victory or or, you know, as as far as who starts at quarterback? What do you guys think? Go ahead, Vish. Well, first, to answer your question, does it matter in terms of victory? Yeah, it matters. Um, Brock Purdy is a better player than Sam Darnold. We've seen that in their time in the NFL. So surely the 49ers would like to have their better quarterback, which is their starting quarterback on Sunday. Now, in terms of him actually playing, I I think it's a little unrealistic at this point. Yes, he practiced today. But given what you said, Krug, which is the history of the protocol over the last two years, and given the fact that this was late reported, right? He only was report he didn't get the initial concussion like symptoms in Kyle's post game presser on Monday, the day after the game. He only we only found out about it on Wednesday. I, I do think that this is a little bit more problematic in terms of him playing. And ultimately, yeah, for the 49ers, they are then playing with a little bit of a disadvantage there because, again, Brock Purdy is just a better quarterback than Sam Darnold. Yeah. I, it Where are you on matters. this, Jesse? No, it's it certainly matters. I don't I mean, no offense to Sam Darnold, but I don't think anybody wants to see him play football for the San Francisco 49ers. I think that's in case of emergency, break glass. So, yeah, I, I mean, of course, we want Purdy to play. They've lost two games in a row. And going into a bye week, we don't want to see him lose a third. So who has a better chance of playing good football this Sunday between Purdy and Sam Darnold? It's Brock Purdy. But 
Sam Darnold, if he has to play, I mean, I think that he can put it together for a week or two and and not be turnover Sam, I guess. Uh, I don't think that it's guaranteed that he plays a bad football game by any means, but the likelihood of somebody playing good football between the two is definitely goes Purdy's favor. So, yeah, I would much rather see Purdy play football this Sunday. But I don't want to do it to the detriment of another concussion and then you're done for a season or something crazy like that. So as long as he's fully healthy and out and, and ready to go, then I'm all for it. You know, it's funny because I've heard people kind of suggest this week conspiracy theories that, you know, oh, this is just Shanahan getting ready to move out on Brock and move in Darnold and, and Shanahan. The only reason that all that anybody would pay that any attention is the fact that Shanahan referred to Sam Darnold as, as, you know, I don't know if he, well, I guess I'd have to ask the you greatest guys, thrower that, ever. Well, he, he, he brought up Steve Young's name, you know, he brought that up too, Steve Young. Yeah. And when he, and so obviously <laughs> oh, when yeah, you hear Steve too. Young, Steve Young's a hall of famer. When you think Sam Darnold, um, I think 26 year old, uh, journeyman, um, failed top three pick. So, um, you know, as far as, as far as that goes, you know, I, I don't see a conspiracy. I think Shanahan is still all in on Brock Purdy. As far as what I think, I think Brock Purdy's world's better than Sam Darnold. I really do. I mean, Brock Purdy's 13-2, and two, essentially. Sam Darnold has had 60 games in the NFL, 55 starts. He's 21-34. and 34. So one guy's 13 games under 500. The other's 11 games over 500. And yeah, he was 13 and 25 with the Jets and only eight and nine with Carolina. So maybe you take that those Jets years out and say, well, the Jets are the Jets. But still, you got a sub 500 quarterback. You also have a guy who completes 67 percent of his passes, who this year has 24 touchdowns and seven picks against Sam Darnold, who's never completed 60 percent of his passes and has 61 touchdowns and the same number of picks as games started 55. Uh, mix in 143 sacks, and then you look at the differences in quarterback rating. I, I think there's no doubt that Purdy's their best chance to win. And so I was kind of encouraged that he was out there. Um, I did a bunch of videos today. One of them was, can the Niners win with Sam Darnold? I, I said that they could just simply because I looked at the numbers and the statistical profile of the Bengals, and the Bengals are terrible at stopping the run. The Niners have a pretty good run game. Uh, the Bengal, the Niners, you know, are the Bengals can't run the ball at all, and the 49ers have a rare, very good run D. So I, I typically will always side in the favor of the team that can run the ball and stop the run, regardless of who's at quarterback. But um, so kind of that's where I'm at. I, I, I think they can beat Cincy with Darnold. I think they will beat Cincy with Purdy at home. Um, that's kind of where I'm at. What, where, what do you look at as the odds of this game? First of all, do we have any indication at all on the spread? I mean, is the spread the same with Purdy as no. it is with I, Arnold? No, it, it is, dropped, right? It went from minus six and a half to three and a half, right? Five so and a half per, to three and a half, five and a half, so to two three point and a half. swing, yeah. two point yeah. swing because of, of Darnold. Yep. Um, sounds about right. That sounds about right. So the Niners are still favored to win the game either way, just because right. they're at home. Uh, but then I guess the question also is take the quarterback and put him aside for a second. Should the 49ers be favored? I feel like, yeah, the 49ers are, have the better record and they're at home, but you know how much importance um, NFL coaches put into preparation there. There are coaches that hem and haw when, Hey, we played on a Monday and they played on a Sunday and we have one less day the Niners are coming off a short week on the road, traveling back from Minnesota. The Bengals are coming off a bye. We'll have essentially like 13 days of rest. Shouldn't, should, shouldn't the Bengals maybe be given a, shouldn't that be paid a little bit more or given a little bit more credence? Just seems like if rest means that much and it's one day, um, wouldn't one team off a short week and the other team off a 13 day break really favor the Bengals? I mean, I think the 49ers should be favored because they're the better team. But at the same time, I think the Bengals are more desperate. And I think that they have enough talent to win this game. 
I I was sure that I was going to on the Behind Enemy Lines show pick against the 49ers for the first time this year. I really and then when it came down to it, I didn't have the gall to do it. I picked the 49ers to win 24-23. Now that was also before the news of Brock Purdy. I think if Sam was playing, uh, I probably would have picked the 49ers to lose, but we still don't know the answer to that question yet. So I'm going to operate under the assumption that Brock Purdy's playing, but they present some unique challenges because they can run the ball, and we've seen that, you know, be a little bit of an issue for the 49ers the last couple of weeks in, in, you know, some spurts or what have you. But also, they have an elite receiver, and the 49ers have not faced an elite receiver yet. And I cannot get Jamar Chase's rookie season out of my mind <laughs> when he played for Kansas City and went for like 11 catches. Mooney Ward 200, played for Kansas City. Or yeah, Mooney Ward played for Kansas City. Yes, you're right. And uh, they played against Kansas City, did Cincinnati, and he went for like 11 catches on 12 targets, 266 yards, and three touchdowns. Now, all of that was not on Mooney Ward, but Mooney Ward did give up well over 100 a yards and a touchdown that game. Seven catches, I think, on eight targets or something. So Jamar Chase is is not at all <laughs> worried about the cornerbacks for the San Francisco 49ers. And so I, I am a little bit concerned that they can get things done through the air with regularity against the 49ers. And if it comes down to a shootout, I don't know that the 49ers at this point, depending on, you know, if Trent Williams plays, Brock Purdy plays, what have you, if they can get into that type of game and and go out and win. I'm not sure. Well, we did see them play Jamar Chase um, a couple years ago in 2021, and D'Amico Ryan's had a really good plan, and they played cloud coverage on D'Amico or on Jamar Chase's side the full game, and they did it with Ambry Thomas, actually. Which, for those of you who don't know the little jargon, that zone, but go ahead. Yeah, and it's basically, you. it's like you play cover two almost with a, a deep third player behind him, and then you have a corner squatting on anything underneath, and the corner is called the cloud corner. So he's playing cloud coverage. So they did squatting that. Squatting would be defined. No, I'm just checking. Go ahead. <laughs> so <laughs> they did that for the majority of the game <laughs> against Jamar Chase, and it, it was successful until it wasn't. And Jamar Chase scored two touchdowns, if I remember correctly, in that game. So it, there, they did have success for a while doing that. And I do think that it's an interesting matchup because of that. But I think ultimately Krug nailed what this game is going to come down to, in my opinion, on the head. I think it's less about the Niners offense versus the Bengals defense, though I think you did underrate the Bengals run defense. They started off the year with their run defense being very poor, but they're coming on the back half of a very, very impressive performance against a somewhat middle of the road run defense in Seattle or rushing offense in Seattle with a very good running back in Ken Walker. And that front is going to be difficult for the Niners, Niners to handle without um, Trent Williams. If you're talking about DJ Reader and BJ Hill, who are both very good players, Hubbard and uh, Hendrickson are obviously terrific players. And then Jermaine Pratt is the most underrated linebacker in the sport. He is an awesome player and Logan Wilson is very good as well. So I don't know that the Niners will have that success running the ball, but let's push that aside. The game is going to come down to me to whether the Bengals can run the football against the 49ers. The Bengals don't run the ball well at all. Part of it is because of their scheme, right? They're very spread out. They don't get condensed because it helps their pass game. When you don't get condensed and you never put your quarterback under center, it's very difficult to run the football from there. And so they are, I think, 30th in the league in rushing, uh, averaging like 69 yards a game. So they're not very good at rushing the football. The one thing that Minnesota showed that I thought was a continuation of what the Rams showed and was a little different from what the Browns showed, but it was all in the same realm, was that it's not that you can run the ball against the 49ers because the 49ers do have a statistically somewhat decent run defense. It's that you, can, if you stay committed to the run against the 49ers, you can successfully grind it out. So Cleveland got 34 runs against the 49ers. Minnesota got 21 runs against the 49ers, and they were able to dominate the time of possession and convert third downs and all of that. To me, the game is going to come down to whether Cincinnati is going to stay committed to running the football. Because if they are able to run the football, and if Sam Darnold's playing quarterback, I do think this is going to be a difficult game for the 49ers. But nothing about the Bengals tells me that they're going to magically come into Santa Clara and all of a sudden have a run game because they're coming off of their bye and Joe Burrow's calf feels a little bit better. So I do like the Niners ultimately to eke out this game. But I think it's going to be very similar to how the second half was 
for the Bengals against Seattle, where it's a little stalemate, grinding it out, grinding it out, grind it out. And that's where the Sam Darnold question ultimately comes into play, because the one thing that's inhibited Sam Darnold the most from having success in the NFL is that he's a walking turnover. And Krug put up the statistics in a game that's close, in a game that's coming down to a small margin of error. Can you rely on Sam Darnold to take care of the football in that kind of a game? And that's a different question. And so there, I think it's very interesting because in my opinion, like Krug, as much as I think Sam Darnold can be successful with this 49er supporting cast, I do feel a lot more comfortable if Brock Purdy plays in this game. I do feel like, hey, in, in that kind of a game, Brock Purdy is not going to give it away. Brock Purdy is not going to make those mistakes. I don't have that confidence with Sam Darnold. I didn't know you were such a Jermaine Pratt fan. Well, how did you uh, describe Jermaine Pratt? Were you the most underrated player in in football or something? One Linebacker. of the most underrated linebackers in the sport. I think so, yeah. He's a really? good, very good player. I think so. Wow, I think the good. other guy is really good, too. Logan Wilson. Every year they play really, really well down the stretch of the year. Okay. All right. Why, you uh, don't like Jermaine Pratt? No, I, I, like I, I, just, Jermaine I, I, really, Pratt, I thought so. he was kind of a neutral player in my mind, but I, I'll have to look at him again. I respect your keep opinion an eye greatly. On 57. I'll keep an eye on. I'll keep an eye on Mr. Jermaine Pratt. If worst I, case scenario, you get to say Jermaine Pratt a couple more times. Who does dare love I that? disrespect Jermaine Pratt? Um, I asked uh, Steve Wilkes about Jamar Chase because Jamar Chase, by the way, the last two games, thirty-two targets. They are yeah, going to Jamar, and they're games. moving him around. Yeah. The year the yeah. Niners played He's them, special. right? We talked about them playing cloud coverage. He lined up at X 99% of the time, and he would be the single isolated receiver in a three by one and stuff like that. The last two games, because of the 24 7, 7 11, they've been moving Jamar Chase around every which way to get him the ball, which is scary because he is spectacular with the ball in his hand. He's a Debo type. When I asked Brandon Allen, I said, What separates? This was about a month ago when I talked to him. I'm like, You were, you played with, with, uh, Jamar Chase, what you know, what separates you've seen a lot of different receivers. What uh what makes him so special? And he just said, you know what, he's just a freaking freak of nature athlete. He's like, this guy's his his running, his jumping, his explosive ability, whatever speed you're running at, he can still separate. You know, he's got like that ability to just separate, even if he's going up against a corner with lightning speed. He's just, he's just such a spectacular athlete. He's like, he he's incredibly competitive at the catch point. He's, he's slithery Strong. quick at, in and out of the breaks. Uh, you don't realize it. And yeah, he's got great strength, but he's got great explosiveness. You know, it's funny. Cause if you look at chase, there's bigger receivers, there's guys that are faster for the stopwatch, you know, everything about him is there's somebody who's bigger, faster, you know, but he might be the best. Do you do you think he is the best guys? I mean, if you if you said Jefferson Chase, I think most people would say those two guys are no. I one, would take Tyreek Hill. Okay, you want to go Tyreek? Second, Tyreek's got explosiveness that those guys have. These guys have receiving ability that Tyreek I think doesn't have. Oh. Who's who's the best receiver in football? You can have one guy. Who do you want? That's tough. I, I mean, I, I don't think you can go wrong with the three that you mentioned. You can add in Devontae Adams. You can add in Diggs as well, I think, I, I, between yeah. those five. Yeah. Whatever order you want to put them in. And I think it comes down to preference and what you're looking for. Adams is a little bit longer in the tooth, so I don't know how much longer he's going to be able to keep this going. But at this very moment, he's still a, a very, very good receiver. And Cup. So. And Cup. We can't forget Cup. Yeah, I don't. I've always had cup b a little bit below that. I mean, I just, I don't know. That's just me personally. I, I'm not as big. Fair on enough, cup. I think enough. cup's a top 10 receiver. I think he's a hell of a player, but especially watching Puka Nakua kind of come in and do his best cup impression. I'm like, all right, it's good. I'm not saying he's not good, but come on. Like, okay. Okay. That's fair. Yeah. For me, <laughs> if you I take Jamar think... Chase out or or some of those other guys we talked about, yeah, yeah, like, yeah, he is, tier is not probably replacing below. Him. He's probably a tier below. You're right. Though, though, though me, I will say I this: go... after watching Cup oh, against the Niners, I, you know, in the in the NFC Championship game, when the money was on the table and somebody had to step up and make plays and get open and you know, with with all the pressure, man, he sure elevated in that moment. And he's really good with the ball in his hands. Really underrated with his run after catch. For me, it's Tyreek Hill one, Jamar Chase two. I, I just feel like those are the two guys in the NFL that you can say that any spot on the field, if either of those two touch the ball, they could score. 
And to me, that's a scary thing to have. And that's the scariest thing to me. They're the two scariest that way. And then it's Jefferson, Adams, Diggs, all the guys you name. But I would probably go Hill one, Chase two. Maybe it'll be Jamar Chase in a couple of games. Who knows? Because he's starting to come on. I also shows. think AJ Brown's starting to creep up. Yeah, there too. he's like, around AJ there Brown's for really, sure. Really, really good. For sure. Really good. Yeah. yeah starting right. to, uh, you, you know, I, you, I wonder if we would have a different opinion if, if Devontae was still in Green Bay, just back shouldering people to death. Yeah. You know, I mean, he, he's still amazing, right? Yeah. That seems he's somewhat good. unstoppable watching it. Um, all right. Let's get back to Brock Purdy because Brock Purdy um, played an incredible three quarters last week. Then the Niners used him in the two um, quarterback sneaks. On the very next play, he threw his worst pass. People say, I don't know, to me, I, I think the one to Ray Ray at the end was even worse than the one that you won. You know, after listening to Greg Cosell on the radio this week describe what he felt he saw on the ball to Jay, on the ball to Jennings, he said that the corner forced outside leverage and that the ball was where it should have been, that Jennings just didn't get a chance to work his way back because he was kicked outside, and that that um, also that Brock didn't get to follow through because of the rush, and if he had followed through, the ball wouldn't have been so in the middle, would have been closer to, to J.J., and he would have made a play on it. That was, that was Cosell's thought from having watched the film and talking to the NFL Films people. It's funny, though, because when Shanahan was asked about it, he kind of went the other way and said that, you know, that Jennings kind of absolved Jennings of any blame at all. Right. And said that the ball should have been closer to Jennings. And you would think that Shanahan, as the divisor of the of the play and knowing the offense uh, would would, you know, you'd you'd almost defer to him right on that in that situation. But the way Cosell described it was such conviction that. um Maybe it was a combination of factors, and Shanahan, to some degree, is is standing up for his receiver. Also, maybe Shanahan sees the game more like you know, in a receiver's goggles because he was a receiver. So you always got to factor that in as well. But Purdy made two really bad throws. Um, the second one ended the game, and he finishes twenty one of thirty two seventy two. That those numbers aren't bad, but one touchdown, two interceptions. Uh, the O-line did a nice job. Daniil Hunter got the only sack. It wasn't like Purdy got hit all day. He didn't get hit all day. Um, what do you, What's your guys' feeling now that we know that Purdy was concussed on the quarterback sneaks? Does that Then, of course, the question, and the one thing I didn't get a chance to, I thought we were going to get a chance to talk to Brock today, and I was gonna, planning on asking him, um, hey, how, how, you know, only Brock knows, right? I mean, he said that, the reports are that he didn't start feeling concussion symptoms until he was on the plane, but who knows? I mean, that could have just been like, Hey, that's when he told, that's when he revealed, but something tells me if he actually got concussed on the quarterback sneak, that he probably was a little foggy in the plays thereafter. It's not like a delayed effect thing. Anybody who's had their bell rung knows that, you know, you feel the effects immediately. I can remember having a concussion in high school football when my head snapped back and hit the ground and my ears were ringing and my whole equilibrium was shot and I wasn't playing quarterback at the time. And, you know, I, I wasn't worth a damn on the next two plays. So I just don't know exactly, you know, what level of concussion or how much his eggs were scrambled at that point. But does it change anything about, how you guys view those interceptions knowing that he's in concussion protocol because of, and that's the other thing. We don't really even know what he's in concussion protocol on. I asked Shanahan, I said, was it the, was it the quarterback sneaks? And he said, he couldn't say definitively, but he thinks so. It looked the, the, the one of those. Yeah, I mean, he got rocked like, on the yeah, first tush push. One. I think that was the it. first, the tush first push one. He got rocked. Right. Yeah, and the, and, and his head, his head did jerk back. So, I don't know. What well, does it change anything about I'm not absolving. You know, I'll say this. Brock Purdy's not going to make excuses. The Niners are not going to make excuses. Shanahan's not going to make excuses. Everybody's wearing it. Um, but do you does it change your perception of those picks now that you know he's in concussion protocol? 
I don't think it's necessarily making excuses. I think it's just bringing up exactly what happened. Um, but what I, I'm not going to do is I'm not going to speculate. Um, the 49ers don't seem to know that he had a concussion. He didn't say, I mean, going out in the media, usually like if you have a concussion, like bright lights are going to kind of mess with you a little bit. They're not going to put their quarterback in front of the media after the game if they have a concussion and they know it. So I think it was pretty clear that nobody had any idea, at least at that moment and even right after the game, maybe it impacted things, but also maybe it didn't. So I'm not going to speculate on whether it did or it didn't. I'm just going to evaluate what I saw and what I saw during those plays was not good, but I don't, I'm not going to speculate on whether it did or it didn't. It could have, but it may not have. So not sure. Yeah, I, I'm not sure. Uh, as Jesse said, it's hard to know. It's hard to speculate. I do think it could have had an effect. Um, I don't necessarily look at his entire performance, whether I knew he was concussed or whether I didn't know he was concussed as a bad one at all. I thought he played well for the majority of that game. The first pick, I thought it got away from him a little bit at the time. I thought Jennings added an extra stem to the route. When you go back and watch it, it does Head feel out. that way with Purdy's yeah. right with Purdy's placement, but Shanahan said that he ran the route correctly. So if that means he ran the route correctly and Purdy just threw that ball too far inside. It happens. And then the second pick, it was just a bad decision in the moment, but he's a young quarterback going through that experience for the first time, regardless of how many games he's played in college, he's going to have a moment where he takes an opportunity. And in that case, it didn't work out for him. That's a learning moment for him, but I thought he really played well for the majority of that game. Um, so I don't know that how much, whether he was concussed in that moment, whether it affects him, it's hard for me to know any of those kinds of things. I think the bigger question mark and the fear is obviously how long he is out. And that's a different question because again, I do feel like as I, I think Sam Darnold can be fine in a lot of ways it, with this 49ers supporting cast and all of that, but that doesn't mean they don't need Brock Purdy. And so, yeah. You know, there's this other thing that's that is a very much a factor. You you know, Christian McCaffrey in um, in a in a hard hit that he took earlier didn't want to come out of the game. Why? Because he didn't want the referees to think that he was concussed. Mm -hmm. And when these guys these guys are so competitive, when the game's going on, it almost feels like they're not really in full disclosure mode. <laughs> on on these head injuries because of the way the rules are and they don't want to be taken out of the game um and that was an example where McCaffrey basically said you know hey I wanted to get I wanted to play that next play because I don't want the officials to think I was concussed because then I couldn't come back in the game and who knows I mean there's this these the, the concussion protocols in game it seems really kind of they have that independent person there, though, now for monitoring exactly this after the Tua situation. If you remember, Tua had the banging his head versus Green Bay. Then he threw the three picks. Very similar to Brock Purdy, where he hits his head. Nobody knows he's concussed. He throws two picks. Everybody's like, what happened? Blah, 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 blah. And then we find out he's concussed. Um, they After but that, that they added... Yeah, after that, they added that individual person in the stadium that's independent of both teams that's solely looking for players that bang their head or showing any concussion-like symptoms to remove them from the game. If you remember, Alexander Madison took a pretty big hit from Dre Greenlaw early in that game, and he got himself straight back up, and it was like, yo, I think he got his lights shut out a little bit. And he got up and didn't show the symptoms. I think it's not because the referees. I think it's because of that independent arbor arbitrator who can pull them from the game at any point and say they have concussion-like symptoms. And then if they get into the protocol, you don't you don't know what's going to happen because they might not be allowed back in the game. Mm -hmm. But they examined the guys in the tent, and did Brock ever go to the tent? No, I, I would say so. no. I don't think he no. did. Yeah. So it's like one of those things. It's like okay, so yeah, we have people in place to, to you know to you know, to examine you, but you, they examine you in that blue tent and he never actually went to the blue tent. So did he, you know, and it's like, sometimes you kind of wonder if guys are deking these, you know, guys out of, out of even the possibility of going to the blue tent because they know how it works. You know, here's the other thing in football. It happens all the time. You'll see it all the time. Every Sunday on almost every game, somebody gets hit hard and they raise their hand and they come out. Well, they don't all go to the blue tent, but that's almost kind of like, Hey man, I need a blow. 
I need, uh, I need, and a blow could just be, I'm out of wind. A blow could be like, I landed on the ball and I've lost my wind. A blow could be, I'm a little fuzzy. You know, guys raise their hand to come out for a play or two. And you wonder in that situation, not all those guys who raise their hand go into the, into the tent and are examined for concussions. I don't know. We're, we're really in a, you know, kind of a, I feel like we're in an age where we're in the in-between stage between the way concussions used to be dealt with, which is like only if you totally complained to now it's like a little bit more out of your hands and the league has more control and they're trying to do best by the players, but the players also seem like they're kind of trying to avoid it, you know? And then I remember in high school football, a lot of times guys would be like, you'd see the trainers come out you'd be like, get the trainers away because guys wanted to stay in the game, you know, and you even see it now. There's guys that re- like, who was it? Warner that got knocked out of the last game and he went to the sideline and like, literally he's like getting his helmet back on. He wanted to go in on the next play. So it's kind of the way they're wired too. So it's like, sometimes you kind of wonder if the rules have to be created to protect these players from themselves. You had Jamal, Jamal Adams who hadn't played in a year gets back and like exactly. three plays in or whatever. Get, ha, shows concussion symptoms and he's like pissed off. He's like pushing Swear, referees yeah. off. He's like, oh, he's no, pissed. like, well, I'm not going in there. Like, let me play. I haven't played mm-hmm. in a year. So, yeah, I mean, there definitely is that element where players are certainly trying to avoid getting into any sort of protocol or going in the tent or any of that stuff. So, you got to protect them from themselves. And, you know, it's, concussions are one of those things that it's like, who knows? You know, players. Know. Players don't show it necessarily right away. Like to the naked eye, you can't necessarily tell. And then it's like, okay, well, you know, X, Y, Z happened. And you're like, well, in hindsight, maybe it, maybe it was obvious, but I didn't think it was obvious in the moment. And I, who knows? Well, and it, and then I heard an interview the other day on uh, 95.7 The Game with Bernie Kozar. And Kozar said over the course of his football career, he had like 88 concussions or yeah. some ridiculous number. And I almost felt like saying, 88 times you got you got taken out of the game no you know no, no you did not no, it never happened so it's in other words it's almost like a number that you get like the real number later in your career or maybe maybe when you're done playing you admit to a number that's far higher than you admit to on game day if you added them all up i don't know there's a, it's a it's a very murky situation the other part of the quarterback sneak thing that really is called into question is that we are now seeing a dominant play in the Philadelphia Eagles with the tush push and the Eagles do it better than anybody. And they've got, they've got a, they've got a hall of fame center. They've got a really powerful drive blocking left guard in Landon Dickerson. They got a, a quarterback who can squat 800 pounds. Who's got <laughs> unbelievable leg strength. Everybody gets super, super low and they push forward. And it's like, they do this play better than anybody. And for some reason, Hertz never seems like he gets concussed. Um, and the rest of the league can't do what can't can't, you know, execute this play the way they do. And I asked Chris Forrester today about it. I said, you know, there's players that come in for all kinds of substitution reasons in the NFL. Why not? If you're going to go to a quarterback sneak, especially in consecutive plays, why do it with your quarterback? And it, why, why do it at all? Like the Niners have Jake Brendel at center. He's 280. They also have a backup center. His name's John Feliciano. He's like three and a quarter. Why not take Brendel off the field? Why not take Purdy off the field? Why not take everybody small off the field and replace them with Huschek at court at full at quarterback yep. and uh, Feliciano at center and, you know, some, some drive blocking backup guard, Nick Sakel at running back and change out the personnel if you're going to quarterback sneak it and go with the, you know, you're going to try to copy the tush push. And he's like, well, you know, our um, Forster's answer was, you know, there's there's the kind of quarterback sneak where you're like, hey, we're going to quarterback sneak. And then there's the quarterback sneak that they try to run the second time, which is have one player outside and threaten the potential of doing something else to try to keep that those extra that one or two extra bodies out of the a gap and to kind of try to run it like a regular play but what do you what do you guys think i mean if you're do you think that this 
are we now in an era where we're seeing a play that the NFL is going to basically, you know, uh, make illegal at some point? And then I guess I got to ask the other question. What's the wisdom of, let's say Brock Purdy's make, he's making $840,000, but he's still their starting quarterback. What if he's, what if it's three years from now, he's making $42 million. Why would you risk reward? Why would you ram your $42 million quarterback head first into the nose guard and, and inside linebacker in and subject him to that kind of a hit? Even if you've got Jalen hurts and he's got more talent, I'm sure Philly's got somebody who's more powerful. Why did not just snap it to Kenneth Gainwell direct snap and go that route? Do you think we're seeing, do you think, do you think they'll outlaw the, the quarterback sneak at any point? Do you think we're going to see, because the Eagles are making, the Eagles could win a Super Bowl on third and short, fourth and short, push, push, everybody in the A-gap push. It's going to get lots and lots of attention, but it also kind of shows that if, you know, it puts the quarterback in harm's way, the quarterback's the most valuable guy in the field. I mean, I th- I think I do think the NFL is going to ban it at some point. I don't do. think that they enjoy the call or at all. I don't think they enjoy watching that happen. I said after like week one or week two that Philadelphia has got an advantage because they're they look at things as like first and eight. Everybody else looks at it as first and ten. And Sirianni came out this week and said, uh, you know, hey, we look at it as we do have an advantage. We look at things as first and nine. Um, you know, so I'm off by a yard there, I guess, and how they look at it, but. They do, and they should look at it that way. I also don't think it should be banned. I think if you choose to build your roster a certain way and you can do things that other teams can't, then that's a competitive advantage, and you chose to build your roster that way. Not everybody, and everybody's tried to copy what Miami does with this uh, motion, you know, running along the the line of scrimmage with Tyree Kill and, and uh, Jalen Waddle and then snapping the ball. And nobody can execute it the way they do because nobody has the speed that they do. Should you take that play out because Miami has an advantage? Like, no. Teams have certain competitive advantages because of the players that they chose to put on their roster. And that is Philly's competitive advantage. If you don't like it, stop it. Yeah, I I used to be a big hater like of the tush push. I thought it was stupid. I thought they should outlaw it. But I've changed since changed my mind. I'd like to think evolved my thinking on it. Um, watching other teams try to execute it. It's a very dangerous play, and it's a play that's 100% about leverage. And if you're willing to risk your Hall of Fame center, your Hall of, you're not your $250 million quarterback and all of this for one yard, then be my guest. You deserve to be able to do that. At some point, I do think that the risk of the play is going to catch up to the Eagles. And I also think that at some point, someone's going to stop it. This isn't one of those things that I think is completely unstoppable. I think that somebody's going to come up with some crazy plan of leverage. And I think that's when it could get banned because I think whatever somebody's going to do to stop it is going to be very dangerous. And that's where they're going to avoid this collision altogether. Either way, I don't know why the tush push element even needs to be added to it because when you're a yard away, the quarterback sneak is pretty much unstoppable. If you have a quarterback that's willing to get low enough and then they pushed that guy anyway. I mean, Brady was unstoppable for how many years the quarterbacks need. I mean, we had statisticians on the 49ers beat tracking how successful Jimmy Garoppolo was year after year and complimenting him and commending him and parading him for being a great quarterback sneaker. Um, And either way, in Purdy's case too, the funny part is in it, I was watching the Manning cast at the time and they pointed out him getting absolutely walloped by Harrison Smith when they did do the tush push. And he looked really unnatural. He got way high on the sneak, and he basically ran himself into a brick wall to get hit by Harrison Smith when they did the tush push. And then when they went back to the conventional sneak um, on fourth down, by the way, it was kind of wild that it took them second and one, third and one, and fourth and one to get that first down at that point. That well, That's maybe a talking point for another time or perhaps in the past when we were analyzing that game. But when they went back to the conventional sneak on fourth one, he got way lower. Now there was a gap, so it made it very easy for them. But he got way lower and got through and got there. So I, I think that ultimately it's going to come down to – and the Niners, by the way, had a smart plan for the tush push. They loaded up the A-gap with all three guys getting super low in the four-point stance, and then Warner came over the top to pull him back. 
and that was what Warner told me this week that that was he, nobody that wasn't devised. He just he's just he thought that the quarter he said that they had seen in the film that Cousins went a little high mm-hmm. on the quarterback sneak, and he thought the best way to do it was to pick him off in the air. But you lose all your power in the air. As soon as you're right, in the air, right. you have no power, you have no leverage. You know, you're just like, uh, you know, hurling yourself over. And, you know, it's 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 interesting to me. There's one thing that will make them change it. And that is if it gets to the point where teams are getting more than three or four yards, because let's be honest, you're right. They don't need most quarterbacks can get a yard or half a yard on a quarterback sneak. On the tush push, if you've got a good enough center, powerful enough player at guard, and a, and a, and you get leverage, we're seeing uh, Jalen Hurts get two and a half, three yards, sometimes more than three yards. Well, wait a second. As soon as you get more than three yards, you could make an argument. Like, give, let's they talk. Could let's, line up and tush push every single play because mathematically they'll keep getting first downs if they're getting three yards to tush push. Let's say the Niners last year with no Josh Johnson said, you know what? We can't do this any other way. We're going to put Christian McCaffrey at quarterback and we're going to go tush push first down, second down, third down, and we're going for it on fourth down. So we got four downs to come up with 10 yards. All you need is two and a half, three yards, and you're you're home. If you get if you if one of those plays goes for four yards, you're home. You're just first down, first down. If anybody ever did that and moved the ball down the field, it would be the worst thing out of all time to watch. And that's when they would outlaw it because well, it would kill the, the audience. Danger of the play, though, right? Like the Giants had what two offensive linemen hurt when they tush pushed last week? Was it two or one? They had two offensive linemen that got hurt on the tush push, right? How how come the Eagles never get hurt on this play? <laughs> that that's the million dollar question, right? Fletcher Cox, Brandon Graham, Jason Kelsey, and Lane Johnson have been playing year after year, seemingly. Knock on wood for them. Good for them. But yeah, it is inherently dangerous. That's the point. I think we all agree, and that's where I think for the Eagles they've been a little fortunate. And again, if they're going to put two hundred fifty million dollars in their Hall of Fame center on the line. Every single time for just one yard, that's their prerogative because at some point I think the risk is going to catch up to them. And if you don't take the quarterback off the field, you can hit the quarterback. Well, you're not supposed to go helmet to helmet on anybody, right? You're not even supposed no, to go helmet no. to helmet on a running back. So no. that hit to the helmet on the quarterback, should that have been a penalty? Only if it was helmet to helmet. I think it was forearm to helmet or something. Uh, okay, Harris's I thought it was spread. helmet yeah. to helmet. Um, all right. I so it was go. helmet to helmet too. Actually, I thought it was, was helmet, it helmet to helmet. I, oh, I, only saw, helmet. I only saw the all 22 view of the hit. And I, it, to me, it looked like his arm came around. I don't know. Maybe it was I mean, helmet to helmet. What I a involved. terrible TV show. If you really think about it, if somebody wanted to just go quarterback sneak all day and you could not hit the guy in the helmet and he's leading with his helmet. Oh, and it then, was helmet to helmet looks, you like. know, I mean, and then there are, there are penalties, even though we don't see them. If you're a running back and you lower the crown of your helmet and go at somebody, they can call a penalty on you as well. Yeah. So never isn't call that it though, right? Isn't that kind of what the quarterback is doing in that play? Lowering the head and leading with the helmet, using the helmet as a weapon. It's just it's it's a it's it, you know the further this game goes along, the more it evolves, the more you know um, it's a little bit of a chess match. But it almost kind of like you, teams start out out of desperation to win, they start inventing things. And then the rules have to fall in line. So it makes you wonder about the future of this play, especially if the Eagles go on and win a Super Bowl this year. Um, because I'll say this you guys watch Sunday Night Football, uh, Dolphins, Eagles. Man, I mean, Sirianni went for uh, the tush push on his own 25 yard line, you know, uh, in a key moment of the game. I mean, it's like they're so good at it. They never get a false start, they always seem like they get the first down. That it's an it seems when you're watching the game like they have a major advantage. And when you watch them, you're like, wait a second, if they can just get to third and two, I mean, like if they get eight yards on first down, you're like, oh, good. Get you're waiting for the next series to start or the next, you know, ability to stop them because, you know, you can't stop them when they have second and two and they're, they're going to go for it on fourth down. You know, I mean, so that means they got two downs to get one yard and then the tush push. And now it's first down again. And they're dominating the clock. 
So it, I don't know. It's it's bad to watch. I don't know if it's sustainable, but that's where we're at with that play. All right, you, but do you think they should ban it, Larry? Or do you think like, listen, I, that's their competitive I, I, advantage. I do like, think, deal with I, it. you know, it's like I I think that they will ban it because I think it's terrible television. I agree uh, with should that. should ban it. I don't you know, it, it, it seems like, Jesse, there's so much emphasis put on protecting the quarterback. And then if the quarterback leads with his head and it because they all I mean, how do you do a quarterback sneak and not lead with your head? I've never seen any every quarterback sneak. The quarterback, to some degree, is moving forward with their head. So then what any hit on that head is all just automatically. I mean, it puts the quarterback in harm's way. I mean, all it's going to take is for a couple of premier quarterbacks to get knocked out in using this, and that alone will make them ban it. I don't know. I don't know what the answer is. I, one, I don't think it's a particular. Well, I know it's not a particularly interesting play. I would rather. I'll tell you what I don't understand more than anything. I don't understand when the Niners go short yardage out of the shotgun. That to me, I've never understood why. You know, it seems like the opposite mentality of the tush push is to go short yardage running play out of a shotgun. Why? Why start three yards behind the line of scrimmage when there could be penetration and you've got to get from three yards back to the line of scrimmage and then get forward by a yard or two. It, it just, I don't know. I mean, and I don't think it's good television. So, you know, the whole scrum thing. And then the other thing is I, if they're going to keep the play, I'd like to see them blow the whistle like very quickly because what we're seeing is you get an initial surge and then you get a secondary surge and you may even get a third surge. Well, if you get a third surge, odds are the offense is going to get the get the first down. So I'd like to I'd like to see them blow the whistle a little bit quicker. Um, all right, let's go back to Brock Purdy though for a second. I think that we all knew when Brock Purdy started, whatever it was, 12 and 0, 11 and 0, whatever, that he would lose a game. And I think as he was playing this incredible football, I think everybody intellectually understood that he would lose a game and he would throw picks. And people were real real like oh yeah of course oh yeah i know he'll lose some games oh i know he'll lose he'll he'll throw picks but man he's something else he's special he's the guy and then all of a sudden he lost the game and he threw a pick and then everybody bailed everybody's like fuck that <laughs> i know it's intellectually dishonest but hell with it i don't think the guy's the guy explain this to me there, this was a trend that bothered me to no end. Why? You got to give me some examples, dude. Give you some examples? Yeah, give me some examples. Jesse right. himself is an example. He he tweeted Perfect. about this. Let's talk about it. Let's get into this. Let's I actually had my it. son send me a tweet. A guy says a couple of weeks ago, I'm telling you. Let's be clear. This is not me that you're talking this about. Is not, this, this is not tweet. Jesse. This is somebody okay. else. This or guy goes official, Jesse anyway. officially buying a Brock Purdy jersey tonight. So he's all in on Brock Purdy. The next tweet, this Brock Purdy guy is pretty damn good. All right. Then that's when he won. And then when he lost, same guy, Purdy might not be it, guys. I'm telling you, teams are not afraid of Purdy. <laughs> so it's like. When he went, we all know that no quarterback has ever gone undefeated. We all knew when he was winning all these games that he wouldn't go undefeated. We all knew when he wasn't throwing any picks that eventually he was going to throw some picks. So you, you kind of had to evaluate knowing that the, 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 those things are inevitable. But it's amazing how many people shifted from he's the guy to he's not the guy. No, one as person soon, did. Well, I just gave, no, you know, you just asked for one example. There were many I, people. I, 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 I got to scour the fucking like, internet for you. Go check it out for little, yourself. A little Go do bit because you're because you're asking me to respond to what a bunch of fickle 49ers fans are saying. And honestly, I don't know why they were in on Purdy and why they changed their opinion. <laughs> Well, we, we Je, Je, go ahead, Jesse, because you are are also are in this camp. Of, uh, but hey, but, I'm I, but I wasn't, and and I want to be clear about this. I, I wasn't in that camp because my okay. opinion hasn't changed, Larry. It never has okay. changed. 
and people want to take little bits and pieces and be like, oh, now you're flip-flopping. Like, no, my opinion of Brock Purdy, and I got a video that came out around seven months ago where I laid this out very clearly. I think it's very clear that Brock Purdy right now with this team, we didn't need to see this year to know that they could win games with Brock Purdy and go very far. We saw it last year, okay? So it stands to reason that it could happen again. My whole video, the premise was Mr. Right versus Mr. Right Now. And my point was that I believe that Brock Purdy is Mr. Right Now, but I do not believe that he will be a franchise quarterback long-term. When you start to pay him and you start stripping away talent, I don't think he'll be that guy. That was always my premise. Now, we're not going to know the answer to that for years, and that's fine. But you had people literally, and, and this was, I thought this was embarrassing and not going to be me. You had people literally coming out and apologizing for a football take. Like, let's get this through. People put so much pressure and talk so much shit that people feel like they have to apologize for a football take. Well, why? It's, why do you have to apologize? Why you don't can't you have just have to. the conviction? Larry, that's what I'm saying. You don't have to. And so my tweet said, hey, I'm glad I didn't cave in and acquiesce to all these people that are adding me every week when he plays good. Are you going to apologize? Are you going to say sorry now? No, my take was never that he was a bad football player or that they couldn't win with him now. I never said that. So I'm not going to apologize for a take that I'm not going to know the answer to for a few years. And I'm glad that I didn't acquiesce the way a lot of people did and folded and didn't stand on their own two feet when it came to their takes and started apologizing like to who? who you don't know Brock Purdy and you had a football take. Nobody was getting personal. If you were like, hey, Brock Purdy is not going to be a good football player. Also, terrible human being. Let me tell you. OK, yeah, you probably should apologize because now you're getting personal, but it's a football take. I'm not apologizing for a football opinion. Sorry. Well, no, my, my point my is it's all about never the changed. timing. The it's opinion a, it's the has timing. never changed is what I'm saying. It's the timing of it. It's, it's okay. Um, I, I don't, I, I'm going to say positive things about Purdy when he wins, but then I'm going to remind sure. everybody when he loses that I don't believe in him long term. And I, I, I guess I would say to everybody is, you know what? It's intellectually dishonest. If you, only back a guy when he wins and don't back a guy when he loses. My evaluation of him includes, I know he's going to throw picks. My evaluation of him is, I know he's going to lose games. And that I think he's the guy for the 49ers, short-term and long-term. That's where I'm at. I That's may cool. be right. I may be wrong. And yeah. I'll be, I'm, I'm happy to live with it either way. But that's my evaluation is that he's, and I don't, I don't have like a today, guy and a tomorrow guy i just evaluate it as you are the guy or you're not the guy i think he is the guy hold on i, th I, th I think we're conflating two different things and this is what frustrates me too there's an opinion and then there's being a fan of a team again as a fan of a team you have one job that is to root for the players on the field when they play football so that's what i'm gonna do i never thought jimmy was a good quarterback but I sure as hell rooted for him every time he played. So because I have a take that I don't think Brock Purdy, and this is, this is kind of the vibe that I got from you when you were doing your show the other day, because I have a take that doesn't believe in Brock Purdy long-term being a franchise guy, a guy that's going to carry a team and be worth $50 million a year. I can't root for him in the moment, or I can't evaluate him in the moment and say, Hey, Today was really good. These are the things that he did awesome. Great job. And, oh, today wasn't very good. These are the things he needs to improve on. I, I have to remove I was... myself from being a fan of him well, I wasn't uh, speaking and, and about a fan you, Jesse, of the 49ers the because I have an opinion that I don't think he can be the long-term guy. Like I think, I think we're conflating different things. I think what I'm talking about, and I was not talking about you, and I know after I read your tweet, there were a lot of people going, oh, dude, you're, you're going to need to talk to Jesse. And then all of a sudden I got looked at your tweet, and I'm like, oh, shit, we're going to have a topic to talk about because Jesse is 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 very much like, hey, I don't think Purdy's the guy long term. So my p purpose in bringing this up is I think we've all now seen enough. Okay? Enough time has gone on, and it's time for people to 
get off the fence and commit one way or another. I'm going to commit. You, hold on. I'm you think commit. you need to commit long term right now? You we've seen enough that everybody should commit long term right now. I think you should. I think we've seen enough football, good and bad. There's a lot of how many games do you need? I can't. How many games do you need? I he need hasn't years, even played a year. Really, we're watching Jalen Hurts, who's played for three years, and we still don't know if he's necessarily the guy. This is not a, a one. You don't think Jalen Hurts is the guy? I definitely I don't think know, Jalen Hurts Larry. Is the guy. I'm not saying he is or he's not. I don't know, is all I'm saying. I still, he has so many ups and downs still that I'm like, shoot, I don't know. I don't know for sure. Give me time to evaluate. Like, why do I have to rush to judgment on a guy who has 15 starts in a career and be like, all right, I for sure know this. Now I have given my opinion. Well, I mean, okay, so I, I, we're we're the season started. I gave my opinion. You can I wait to the end of the you can wait to the end of the Kentucky Derby to tell me who you think is going to win, or you could tell I've me given when the my race opinion, is. Larry, going my opinion on. is I don't think long term he will be the guy. I've never rid. I've never jumped off of that take. I haven't. But yeah, it no, doesn't mean that I know that for a fact. I don't know if he's going to be the guy. Just, you kind of referenced it. You kind of you kind of referenced it in your in your tweet that there's like pressure on people to go with Brock Purdy. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I don't there know. is. Look at your chat, bro. Who? Everybody in here, who? you're a Who's clown. You're this. You? You're, come Who's on, man. Like, people anybody? are wild. They're crazy. But I mean, look. I mean, the other day I tweeted out, um, "Hey." I'm not saying that this um, it means anything, but by the way, the Niners played the Giants without Saquon Barkley. They played played the Rams without Cooper Cup. Without and they played this team. They played Dallas without this player. And and I said I'm not saying the Niners wouldn't be undefeated, but I just said it is interesting that they've played all these all these teams without all their these great players. Uh, they missed Trevon Diggs. They missed all these guys. Um, dude, I got all kinds of you know illogical 49er fans dude you know you're you're an idiot and all this stuff <laughs> it's like why i pointed out a fact that the 49ers i'm not saying and i prefaced it by saying i don't know if the 49ers wouldn't have been 5 and 0 oh, but it is interesting to me that every one of these teams that they played that one of their best players was not playing it was a fact it was just a simple fact it was like this team these guys were playing this game these guys were playing it was i didn't say hey the niners are 5 and 0 oh, but in reality they would have been three and two if uh, these team these other guys had played. I just pointed out the fact that they hadn't played, and I got all kinds of hatred. So I get it. You push back against the home team. There's always going to be some pushback, but uh, you you make anything in any way that you that people view as a slight of the Niners, they're going to view it like, "Hey, man, you're attacking my kid." And I'm, I'm Niners. I'm Mr. Niners. So I'm going to push back. Even if I love you. I mean, some of these people are saying heinous things. I'd look at their thing and be like, dude, you're following me. You're following me. And you're, and you're, you're, you got all this vitriol towards me. And I just stated a fact and, and, and I, and I prefaced it, whatever. It just shows the illogical nature it, of it, fans. Here's, here's my, but thing. my point is, my point is how you can wait. I mean, we have people that claimed they loved Brock Purdy that literally put out every negative thought they could possibly come up with or anybody else could come up with about the player and then would say they like him. So that kind of like, hey, I'm talking out of this side of my mouth. Hey, I'm talking out of that side. I love the guy, but I think he's terrible. Yeah, but Larry, I love let's, the guy, let's keep but I don't think he's got a, a good enough arm strength. Larry, let's I keep it a guy. buck for a second. Let's keep it. You do that with Trey Lance. You do, I that do that same with Trey Lance. shit. With I never Trey. Yes, did that with Trey Lance. You, yes, you do. Yes, I never Larry, did with Trey Lance. Larry, every chance you get, you say somehow this guy that's not on our team, you'll say, "Hey, uh, Brock Purdy." You know, Brock Purdy. I mean, he hit all the short passes. We had a guy here who's no longer here that couldn't even do that. But I think he's going to be a franchise guy. It's like, well, hold on a second. That's, like, that's, you can't have it both that, ways. Not, you no, know, first of all, one because we're talking about now. <laughs> Versus the f distant future. I still believe in okay. Trey Lance. Distant future. <laughs> but I've already okay. talked about it. I've said everything there is to say. There, You have to continue to evaluate. He was an incredibly raw prospect. People were, people were arguing this summer that he should have started this year. This year. The coach, I love the coach. The coach in a stream with me three weeks before the season started said the Niners ought to tank the year because they didn't win the Super Bowl and go with Trey Lance because of upside potential. I said that was crazy. So I'm just saying 
there are people that have had I, I talk I did not talk out of both sides of my mouth with Trey Lance. I I said it right up front. I don't think this guy's ready to play right now. And I said it months ago. And I really believe in him long term. And I still do because I believe that it's not rocket science and it's not a million things going on. And you and and he's got all the boxes checked as far as I'm my evaluation. Smart enough, athletic enough, dedicated enough. He's going to get there. I really believe it. To this minute, I believe he's going to get there, but it's going to be in the future. Let not, me let me say not, let me say wasn't going to be please. Heinz Field in Week One, and people were arguing aggressively that Brock Purdy wasn't the guy. And then when Brock Purdy was the guy, then it was like, well, wait a second, I I don't know. I mean, so that that's what I'm saying. It's like. Here we are. We've now seen a bunch of games. I think we've seen enough to say, you know, whether you think the guy's going to be the guy long term or not. And it, guess what? It doesn't matter. Being wrong, it doesn't matter. People, your credibility is not tied to if you're right or wrong on the quarterback. Okay. It's not. It's these people that are so guarded of their opinions. I tried to explain this to uh, Ted Talks Paul. He was like, wouldn't give in on the. On the on the Purdy thing, he just he's not the guy. He's not the guy. I'm like Ted. He completed 95 percent of his passes last week. He's but not the he's guy. Doing, he's doing what you're asking, right? He's staying on his take with conviction. He's standing <laughs> no. on it and he's remaining on no, it. But he's didn't. doing what he you're did. asking. He didn't stand on his take. Three weeks later, he's like, I give. He is the guy. But now, probably he's probably back. I don't know. I don't know. I, I've muted. Here, here, I don't know. Here's my thing. I have Larry. no idea. But my, I'm just my saying, thing is, is okay. make it make a call, right? Like at this point, it's okay to be wrong. Yeah. But all I'm saying is, we all can wait till after the game to tell you who's going to win and be right. Okay, we of all course. can wait till there's a minute left in the game and to tell you, you know what? I think he's right. To me, that's the, the, if you're going to say you think he's right, you, he's good or bad. Make the call when there's still some question. Don't wait until it's a fight. It's a official, and then tell me. Well, you know what? He's won the Super Bowl and he's, you know, he's got a he's got a 90% win percentage and he's the top rated quarterback in the league and he's in his third, you know, you're saying maybe in his fourth year. I mean, you're like literally want to wait till this fourth year to tell me if the guy's good or not. All I'm I, saying no. is just tell That's not just, what I said. Well, you said the Hertz is too too early to judge. Hertz, Hertz is a different situation. Hertz is not. But you're asking two different questions. Wait a minute. If the question if is if he's good or not, I, he's proven he's good. Yeah. The question has never been is he good or not. It's <laughs> no, how I'm, good is what he? I'm saying is he is a franchise completes... quarterback? Is he a top five guy? Should he right. get forty two million dollars when he gets paid and all of those things? And all I've said. Cause you're getting mad at the guy who's actually had a take on it. Cause I'm the one who's just been like, yeah, dude, I got to wait and see every time he plays well. I'm like, yeah, dude, I got to wait and see every time he plays bad. I'm like, yeah, dude, he played bad, but it's not like that's changing everything. And We're I am all eventually like going to find Cause out. Cause I need one year. I got to give, I got to okay, see. So the that's your barometer. You're, you're saying one year. I got to see him start one full year. Okay. So, so How let many me, games let me he started this. so far right now. He's 13 and two. So that's 15 games. I mean, it's two games from now. You'll Dude, make your decision. Uh, no, no. <laughs> okay. If you want me to, I mean, I mean, more so I want to see I'm him asking the question. He's been one want, year. It's a 17 game him, season. He's played 15 I want to games. See him start to finish, be the starter right. and go through the season. So it's one I think full he's good. season. Yeah, I think he's good. And what we'll if there's injuries, Vish? What if it, what if he misses seven games so that, a year? And that that's the point. Then, that plays into it too. Because to me, when we're talking about these guys that are high level franchise quarterbacks, availability is a hundred percent part of that discussion, right? The best quarterbacks start seventeen games a year. We talk about them after the first question of whether they're going to play. We expect them to play seventeen games a year. So then, if he gets hurt again. It's going to be hard when we have that discussion about, well, is he this? Because, yeah, he's played well when he's played, but can he find ways to protect him, protect himself and stay off the field? Some My NFL injuries happen due to fluke, but there's also ways that we see that the Bradys and the Mannings ensure that they stay on the field week after week after week. So there's a lot that goes see, into See, my point is that people just, they don't really support Brock. They're just grudgingly supporting him because they, how could you not? Because he was winning all these games and he has these unbelievable numbers. Yeah, but so who's, how could you but not? People? So, but Jesse on, and I can't answer lots and lots for how other people fans. support or not support Brock. Exactly. Jesse and I, I, I can't tons of people I'm not come through the woodwork that I don't even know. I'm not going to answer for people I don't know. I, I but can't I mean, do that. tons of you know people I mean? coming through the woodwork. I'm just saying I'm, I'm observing Niner Twitter. Okay. And I'm saying lots of people wait until 
he they they like if you said as he's completing 95% of his passes three weeks ago, hey, you, you don't expect him to win every game, right? People would be, of course not. You don't expect him to not lose a game because he throws a couple picks, right? Oh, no, of course not. He's going to throw picks. But then in the moment when he actually loses the game and he actually throws the picks, they bail. They bail and they're like, I'm telling you, he's I, I can't stand this one, too. He's not him. I mean, that that's just so nauseating. But I mean, you know, the there's lots of people who wait until he has one bad game or an interception and they come raining down. They don't believe. They don't believe. And I, I think it's hilarious. And I think Brock at this point. I mean, point he's had one bad game at this point, right? Like well, the some people would say two, was... right? Because some people some people would say the Cleveland game was a disaster. Well, I, I, that's the only one I'm seeing. Do you think the Minnesota game was bad? I don't. I don't think it was bad. I, I don't personally. What I, my evaluation of it is that I think Cleveland was is a phenomenal D. I think that's a great secondary. I think they had a Tomlinson played huge up front. Garrett's a star. JOK is a star, in my opinion. And I think that's just a great defense. Sure, we can I think acknowledge he played all really, that and really say he well played against Minnesota, though, right? He played I think he played well against Cleveland. Minnesota, and then I agree. two picks. I agree. And those two so picks we're, were about terrible. One bad game. Yeah. But I'm not I'm my my point is it doesn't matter because I'm all in anyway. I, I believe the guy is gonna be good. I've I've checked all the boxes, I've talked to the guy, I've viewed all of his film, I've seen enough to know he can process, the ball comes out on time, he's accurate, he's never gonna be the biggest guy. So I know that. But the question is, does he have requisite arm strength? I think he does. So I'm factoring in his weaknesses anyway. And and also, I believe me, I saw him at Iowa State. I didn't think he was that great at Iowa State. Greg Cosell had an interesting thing the other day on the radio where he's like, you know what? Some of the evaluators that he talked to said that not only did he not have great arm strength at Iowa State, that he, his accuracy was kind of spotty. And and so I'm kind of on the lookout for that, for like spotty accuracy and lack of arm strength, with which would then, come on, those are two really huge factors in a quarterback, and that's what I'm looking for. But even so, I think I've seen enough to when practicing in games to know that he's accurate enough in my mind. He's got oh. enough arm strength in my mind. So I'm making the call right now. And I, and if you don't want to yeah, make what, the call right the now, call, that's fine. Though? What's the call? The call is that this is the guy. This is the guy long term. Okay. Now, whether they win a championship or not, I don't know. I don't know if they're going to win a championship. Only what one team went to a What is long term? Though? Though? Yeah, what is the long term though? If you're giving me the terms of like, okay, if you're saying he's the long-term guy, that means you think he's going to get multiple contracts from the 49ers. He's the next 15 years. This is the guy that's going to start. Is that well, the statement you're making? I mean, you know, okay. there's all 15 years. Now you, 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 <laughs> you want to see eight, two more eight games years to from get now. To a full eight years year. from now is Brock Purdy, is Brock Purdy the starting quarterback? I think that's fair. Eight years from now. Do you think Brock Purdy, barring injury, so barring no, catastrophic no, I'm injury. I'm going to predict what he's going to be in eight years, but you oh, guys can't make a statement he's of what guy. he is. I told no, you I'm what I think. No, I'm I don't saying think he's the guy. Because, ask but me here's the, the thing: the, boss, the, game the, question, beats up, the game ask beats me up the your... question. Ask me, do you think Brock Purdy's going to be the quarterback in eight well, years? Well, I'll go make ahead. my own terms. Okay? okay, I don't have to go eight years. Isn't <laughs> eight years is arbitrary? I'll okay. say this: Do you, I think this guy is going to be the starting quarterback? Because not the average career in the NFL is short, and who knows? I mean, this guy could. You know, this guy could be destroyed physically. And I'm giving years. you the out of injury. I'm not uh, injury I'm aside. Saying, I'm saying he's the guy. I'm saying he's absolutely the guy. Okay. In my okay. mind, he's so in eight years, he'll be the quarterback barring injury. Well, I don't know about eight years, Jesse, because eight years a long time. I don't know if anybody's going to be here in eight years. Eight he years ago, I don't know if we'll be alive we'll be on years. Sunday. <laughs> I mean, seriously, eight years. How many quarterbacks in the NFL currently are in their eighth year with their team? Oh, okay, but no, give us the How timeline many? as well. Because this few. is what I'm thinking about when I'm talking, when you ask me, is he the guy? Put my stake on it. I'm not thinking about. I'll Will say three to five. If you want to go long term, I'll go three to five. Yes. I think in the next three to five years, absolutely. He's the guy. Now, I don't know about the franchise. I don't know about the line. I don't know about what he's going to be, how it's going to look. But yeah, I, I actually. If if we had to, if it was like one or the other, like eight years or nothing, I'm I'll go with eight years. Yeah, I'll How go with eight this? years. You think he'll get? He'll think so. You think he'll get a second contract with yes. the Niners and remain yes. a starter through it? Okay, fair enough. Yes. fair enough. That's my evaluation of it. That's and fair. and if I'm wrong, I'm wrong, and I've been wrong before. And that's fine, Larry. I, nobody I just up think here, that it's I, weak. I don't know. It's Listen. weak sauce to praise the guy when he wins and then to say he's not the guy when he loses. You should come out and say. 
he's not the guy after he throws 90 completes 95 percent you should go say he's not the guy after he throws three touchdowns and leads them from behind in the fourth quarter anybody can play the recency bias and wait till the guy loses play to the immediacy factor and be like he's not him after they just threw watch two picks that's all i'm saying it's just really well, really here's easy. my question why do you have to decide? This is annoying to me, and I'm not talking about you, but this entire concept of every time he plays well, I need to have a definitive opinion that tells everybody Brock Purdy is Tom Brady, Joe Montana, franchise quarterback, all of that. And then when he plays poorly, this entire fickle exercise of then writing him off, he's not the guy, whatever, it's a waste of time. No, it he's isn't. It's called courage downs. of your convictions. You either have the courage of your convictions or you do not. You either believe in the guy or you don't. And that's okay. There's nothing wrong. Believe me. I'm not saying I'm right. It's an opinion. I've been wrong tons, tons. And if you don't believe me, go look up my Twitter because I don't erase all my tweets. You'll find all kinds of mistakes. I'm not afraid to be wrong. I don't. People don't watch my channel because I'm right all the time. Hopefully they watch because we're creating some dialogue that makes them stretch their boundaries, entertain them, right? Other factors besides... I'm not, you know, if I was right all the time, I wouldn't have a YouTube channel. I'd be sitting in a posh five star, you know, pimp pad in Vegas, and I would walk down to the casino with girls on my arm every night and just say, you know what, I'll take, yes, I'll Whoa, take the Larry, bills. The wife's on vacation, and all of a sudden, right. she's in Mexico. She's in Mexico. Yeah, At that you know point, who knows? I mean, if, anywhere, if I'm right, really Larry? rolling that fat, I mean, <laughs> she might be okay with it. Um, you know what? I mean, it's, you know, I, I, I wouldn't be doing this if I knew the future, right? I, if I really knew the future, I would just be hanging out in the casino, cashing money, making money every night. I wouldn't be sitting here. I'd just be making money. Just, you know, so it, it's, there's no question. Do you, or do you not know the future? I don't, I don't know the future. All I'm saying is Use your instincts, use your vision, use your your football knowledge, use your perspective yep. and make a freaking call. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and 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 don't be and who cares if you think he's not good and he's good? Who cares? So what? I mean, the, you're not going to lose things, anything. Larry, there's two different things at play. Okay, first of all, I don't I I'm not going to defend other people's takes. I don't care what other people's takes are. But and you I'm see also, them at least. At least you I'm, can acknowledge for that you sure, see them. But I'm also not, I'm very rarely, unless somebody comes at me, like if, if somebody, and, I, and I'm feeling petty, like if somebody comes at me and is like, you were wrong on this, and I'm like, okay, but then we find out later I was right, but they were the ones that kind of started it. Sometimes I'll get petty and be like, ha ha, I was That's right. That's okay. Dude, that, but, be, but listen, petty but is listen, fine. Listen, petty listen, makes the world go around. But hold on. You're my my point go. of this is I'm not the guy that's going to go through everybody's takes and be like, you were wrong and you were wrong. I'm, I don't care. I don't care. But here's what I will say. Because I have an opinion that is different on Brock Purdy, and I think both can be true. You can believe in him with everybody around him and the way the team's set now and not necessarily believe in him long-term. Like Nick Foles won a Super Bowl. Joe Flacco won a Super Bowl. Uh, lots of guys have been good for short stints and haven't been, quote-unquote, the guy long-term. Both can be true. But I, let's take Brock Purdy out of it, okay? Because people get real emotional when you talk about Brock Purdy one way or another. I'm going to give you two quarterbacks that I had a strong opinion on okay. two different quarterbacks. One of them is Zach Wilson. The other one is, uh, who, who's buddy from, uh, I'm drawing a blank Texans Vish. Oh, CJ Stroud. CJ Stroud. CJ Stroud. Okay. When Zach Wilson came out, I said, I don't think he has it. I think that he can do all the wild plays. He can't do the basics. He's never going to make it in this league. And then for two years, I watched that very thing that I thought going into the draft play out right in front of me. But I still don't have the hubris to say that I know for sure he can't. I wanted to see a third year before I was going to write him off completely, even though this is what I thought. I was very firm on that. Made I was very vocal about that opinion. And I watched it for two years. I still was like, hey, you know, I don't know that I'm right for sure. Like, let's give it another year. CJ Stroud had a very strong opinion that he was by far the best quarterback coming out of this draft. Right now, that is very much playing out in front of our eyes. But I'm also not going to have the hubris to say, oh, see, told you I was right. Because in two years, 
he may not be the best quarterback in this class. I like to give quarterbacks usually three years. Sometimes there's a weird circumstance, not three years in the league, by the way, three years of actually playing football before I can say I'm right or wrong. That does not mean I'm not going to have an opinion. I always have an opinion, but I'm not going to say that my opinion was right or wrong. Even when it looks right in the first two years or the first year, I'm not going to have that much hubris and say, oh, I'm right. Because I know in two years that it can change. I've seen it happen with many quarterbacks. So that's my, that's how I evaluate and say, all right, I'll, I'll revisit this in three seasons and tell you if I was right or wrong on that quarterback. Right now, I don't know. Right now, it looks good. Right now, it looks bad as far as my take. But in two years, that could change. So that's where I'm at with it. I'm never not going to give you an opinion. I've been very clear about my opinion and what it is on a lot of quarterbacks, Brock Purdy included. I thought Brock Purdy was a third-round talent. I also don't think he's a franchise quarterback. So I think I was right as far as him being a lot better than what most people thought coming out of the draft. but. I don't know if I'm right on the on the long term thing because it hasn't been long enough. So I'm not sure if I'm right, but I do have an opinion. Absolutely, I have an opinion. C.J. Stroud, by the way, is, by the way, has completed 59 percent of his passes so far. Um, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, it's you, you know, you know. But is I, all, he is he I'm, not the best quarterback is, out of the rookie quarterbacks that have come out so far this year? Like he's by I mean, far been the best. How can we right? even say right? Because I mean, you guys don't want to wait three years. So ask I'm me saying three, right ask now me in the moment, year. has he played the best, Larry? I haven't I haven't studied it enough. I okay. need I, He's I, I need I need more information. Or do you want me to pump my chest and say I was right or do you want me to be fair? I would say be, be like, careful hey, about that. Know. He's completing 59%. Um, okay. no, I, I, I would say be Jay careful. I like CJ Stroud. I like CJ Stroud, but he's completing that 59%. 59% number. Be careful about that's, that's that. Kind of low, that is kind of a low. That is kind of a low percentage 59%. He looks good. CJ Stroud that, looks very good. I know, we'll but see, he, we'll right see. now he's got the same career completion percentage. He has as, nine. He has nine touchdowns Sam, to one interception Sammy as a rookie quarterback on the Texans. No, oh, I know, I know. He's got he's got some good weapons too. Um, I like him actually. I like him. I, but fifty nine percent. When someone show, showed that to me, I was like, "Whoa, that is kind of." John low. Elway completed fifty six point nine percent for his career. Is he a bum? Uh, no, he won. He was pretty good. He was pretty yeah, good. He was, but pretty he, good. He, he was, was he was okay. a bum in the Super he Bowl against the Niners. Okay. All, right, all right. Uh, he was terrible. <laughs> Uh, he was probably the reason they lost the Super Bowl, um, <laughs> <laughs> but he all worked out all right for John. No, I'm just saying it just it's it's so nauseating. It's like the same people, and I'm not saying you, Jesse. I'm saying the same people that are willing to say he's great are just riding this roller coaster, and it's just this whole thing today. Whatever he does today is what he is, and it's like this, this becomes this avalanche and, negativity. And that's what and I'm you can saying. See that's what is Twitter. frustrating to me. That's you can what's see it on Twitter. To me, that's what's frustrating to me. And I, I like again, it's hard for me to answer to another person's thinking, but I think it's frustrating that there needs to be a definitive Brock Purdy career take after every game he's had. If right, he has I a agree. good game, it means holy cow, he's Joe Montana. If he has a bad game. Bench him, play Sam Darnold, whatever extreme argument you want to make negative against him, that's what gets made. And my entire situation with this is we have to see him go through the ups and downs for a year and see how he goes through that. And there's no reason for me when he plays bad to come in and tell you he's the worst quarterback ever. Yeah, he played poorly against the Browns. Bad game. Did not change my opinion of him so far. He's played excellent in a lot of different games this year. It furthered my confidence in him it furthered my confidence that hey he can be this kind of player but it didn't all of a sudden make me think god damn it he's joe montana it's been confirmed just because he played great against dallas on sunday night football there we go he's joe montana and so i i think part of my frustration with this entire conversation this is not specific to you krug this is just kind of how it just goes around on 49ers twitter and amongst everybody else it's just constantly is can you anoint him or can you put him down when hey he's a young player that's having his career play out as well he's going to have ups and he's going to have downs and we can't anoint him after the ups and then cut, cut him after the downs that's not a healthy way to go about going going uh well it's just it's not even about really healthy him. it's just, it's it's totally dysfunctional it's just, it's like you know what we can say and we take the name out we can say that no quarterback wins all the games no. And no quarterback doesn't throw no quarterbacks out there that doesn't throw picks. They all lose games and they all throw picks. Okay, we can have that discussion, but then as soon as 
the quarterback wins a bunch of games, it's like, hey, he's the guy. And as soon as he throws a couple of picks, I told you he's not the guy. I knew he wasn't the guy. I've never believed in this guy. And it's hilarious. And it's like, you know, I, I, I know, I know it fuels Brock to some degree because um, I know what kind of guy he is. And, you know, so he, he's, he, 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 he loves it. It's like, bring it on. But it is interesting because like, if you're one of these people that doesn't believe in Brock Purdy, you had to be sick to your stomach watching the first three quarters of that Viking game because Troy Aikman was making him sound like Joe Montana. Troy Aikman, I, you know, sound like he was in love with Brock Purdy. And then of course, Purdy throws two picks at the end. They lose the game. And, and, you know, now there's a lot of people going, he's not the guy. And then all of a sudden it comes out that he was concussed and it's like, well, wait a second. I don't know. I don't know. I'm not sure. I'm not really sure. So we'll see. It's just, the, it's this constant roller coaster, but it is, it's like there was so much negativity about Brock this summer. So many people were so convinced that Trey Lance was the guy. And then suddenly Trey Lance wasn't the guy. And he's now moved on to Dallas where he's to TBD, right? We don't know. You know what's um, funny to and me then everybody was anti Purdy. And then suddenly he played really well for a few games. And then it's like, Everybody's on the bandwagon, and then as soon as he loses a game here, throws a pick there. But, but Larry, I, I also think he's that there's, the a sense, uh, there's also a sense that it feels like we can't even evaluate him. Like, is it not okay to to say, "Hey, this game was good" or "This game was bad," and not can we just not? So are we it. are we getting to a point where we can't even evaluate him fairly game to game? Like, we we just can't do that. We just I've been saying say, it. Hey, I've been saying he had a bad really game good for twelve games. Just the game that happened today doesn't count. We'll just we'll, we're going to talk about everybody on the team, but Brock Purdy. There's like this weird, like little brother. I don't, I don't know what it is. It's I don't so feel any pressure at all to today. doctor my opinion based on the crowd. Listen, and I'm, I, it's unfortunate that's fine. that people do. But that's there is, said, you though. can't say that there's not a weird vibe that you can talk about. Steve Wilkes not doing what he needed to do. You can talk about the defense not doing what they needed to do. You can talk about the offense not doing what they needed to do. You can talk about Jake Moody. You can't talk about Kyle Shanahan either. That one's off limits. And you can't talk about Brock Purdy. Because the moment you do, it's like this visceral, yeah, you're this right. Yes, you're totally right. It it's is. like, nah, bro, I'm evaluating what I see. It'll when you played good for five <laughs> weeks, I told you, you know what? I don't know what Brock Purdy's going to be long term. I, again, have an opinion but I can't say for sure. But right now, if I'm doing a quarterback power ranking, he was playing like a top three guy, and we were talking about possible MVP. And then two weeks later, it's like, yeah, he didn't have he didn't play great for stints in, in a Vikings game. But he's supposed he? to continue saying right, in that right. moment and that then, he's still the MVP. Exactly. So then should I acquiesce and be like, oh, you know what, though? But Brock Purdy was per. We can't talk about him. Like, no, bro, I'm going to tell you it wasn't good in those two throws. It wasn't good in the Cleveland game. Like, what do you want me to say? You want me to? Right. Do you I'm just saying, Jesse. There's, there's more people. There's more people off the get off. There's more people that get off of the Purdy bandwagon faster, and it makes me think they never really were on. Larry, it. people well, are if never they really on. It, that's their problem, Larry. Why does it bother you? No, Every, so I'm just saying. Like, I, I, let's just give you a Justin one. Herbert, for example. Justin Herbert's career. He's got you know whatever. He's got. Uh, you know, they, they don't win a lot of games. Now, some people say quarterback stat. It's not a, ultimately, you know, I know scouts who literally are like, dude, it is about the wins. It does matter who wins and who loses. And that is an important stat. And I do evaluate. I know st scouts who made hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars who worked in the league for decades, who really believe in the win stat as far as quarterbacks really believe in it. And yet other people would say, hey, no, 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 no quarterback stats not a win stat and like i'm just saying that i get the feeling like people don't ride or die uh or they don't they don't jump off the bandwagon with the guys who are in their minds more proven they ride or die and get off the bandwagon very quickly with brock they larry, like, they do they never really believe the league larry i in my chat every week i have people telling me Oh, you, you didn't you think Josh Allen was really good? Did you see him this week? And I'm like, have you seen him for three fucking years? Like, oh, oh, one week. Now he's not good. People do it with the elite quarterbacks in the league, Larry. Like, of course, it's going to happen with Brock Purdy. Like, it is what it is. Who cares what these people think?
It, like we it can't, you can't let it every week. Bug you. The, funny, the funniest part to me, the funniest part to me, and this is the part that really makes it funny to me, <laughs> is immediately you then get labeled as, oh, you're the Trey guy, the Trey sexual, right? That's what people start calling you. You, Larry, were higher on Trey Lance than me. That's I still the funny am. part to me. Right. And that's the funny part to me because, and that's where this Brock Purdy discussion gets toxic. If you're asking why people are going so far and you're asking why people are feeling pressured, it's because there was such a toxic argument about this for three months straight, <clears> dividing <throat> this fan base. And now anytime somebody doesn't say what they want to hear, they have to then immediately go to that ad hominem attack, right? Like when I say, oh, I need to still wait and see on Brock Purdy, it's because, see, he's a Trey guy, and Trey wasn't that guy. Can anybody find a video of me saying, like, oh, I 100% be, believe Trey Lance is going to be that guy? In fact, I feel like when the three of us used to have those discussions back then, I was the least positive on Trey Lance of the three of us. And I, I still think that's probably the case. Yeah, you're so a hater. Not, what can I say? You're yeah, a hater yeah, on exactly, Lance. Exactly, right? I'm a hater. But it, the point <laughs> is that it's not it's not about like, okay, you have to be able to say this guy is the guy and all that. The guy is playing out his career. We can see him go through it. We can evaluate him game by game, get a better understanding for his game. Right now, it looks like he has the skill set to be the long-term answer for the 49ers. Whether he fulfills that is a different question mark. And there's a lot of things that need to play out in his career for him to fulfill that. I just and have, we'll I, you know, we'll I've spent a lot of time around that. evaluators. So I'm more, I really believe that, you know, I, I have a buddy who used to be our scout for the Raiders and Al Davis went to, was going around the room on draft day. And I forget who it was. Maybe it was Ricky Dudley. I forget exactly who the player was. And he said to this guy, the guy's name was Steve. He's like, Steve. What do you think? <laughs> Who do you want? You want this guy or you want that guy? And the guy's shaking in his boots because he knows he's going to have to be on the record with the big man on does he want this player or that player? And he knows that if he's wrong, he's probably going to get fired. And if he's right, he's probably going to be, you know, um, you know, congratulated down the road. So it's actually kind of a meaningful moment. And he goes, Al. I want what you want. Oh, that's a great answer. <laughs> that is a great answer. <laughs> nice. Well played. Now, how great well is that? Played. And <laughs> and so the guy lasted another couple of years with the team and they chased him out. But he basically just he just kind of admitted to everybody in the room, hey man, I mean I want my job, man. What I really want <laughs> is my job. I like this job, man. I don't want I don't want to be wrong. I want he to be right. Darius, you know he said Darius Hayward Bay. That was the funny thing oh, was, he said Jacoby Ford. The funny thing was, I'm watching film at the Raider Complex before that draft. Like literally, when I say before, I'm talking about like four days before. And my buddy is a is a is a personnel. What guy. year is this? Oof. It was the Ricky Dudley draft. So okay, I would okay. Say when 90, Ricky Dudley came out of Notre Dame, that's like nine. No, no, uh, Ohio State, Ohio State. Ricky Dudley, the spurning fast tight end. Yeah, 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 right? yeah. I know who you're talking okay, about. Okay, so that's my fault. I, so, can, I mix um, him up with the other guy. So we're sitting there, and I didn't know that Mr. Davis was in the office. It was late at night. It was like eleven o'clock at night. And my buddy had me over, and he's like, he's like, you know, you're you got a great eye for college talent. I want you to look at all these guys. And so he was in one room on a Betamax projector, and I'm on the other room. He gave me ten guys, and he's got ten guys. And we were going to switch halfway through. And then we were going to write it down on a piece of paper. It was a little exercise before the draft. Okay. And he's just looking for another opinion. And I get to Ricky Dudley. And I have a rule. And my thing is, I want to know how you play in the biggest game of your year. Right? So I go, so we had the film guy there. And he's like, "You, we're going to get you one film. Which film do you want? I said, I want the Buckeye-Michigan game. Right? So I'm watching the Buckeye Michigan game and I'm rolling the thing back and forth. Ricky Dudley couldn't catch a cold in this game. Balls are ricocheting <laughs> off his hands. He had a ball go off his face mask. Hey, but you picked him ninth overall, it sounds like. <laughs> you were so, the one who picked him. So um, so my buddy goes, he goes, he goes, fucking Larry. What do you think of Dudley? Right? And I go, and I and I I'm I'm rolling the thing back and forth. I'm like, he fucking sucks. He fucking <laughs> sucks. And I hear this, what'd you say? And like this kind of, this kind of, and all it's Mr. Davis. Oh, God. And I'm like sitting there going, oh, sorry. Oh, how you doing? And there's like, and then he's like, <laughs> I'm like, um, 
Well, he's. I'll just say this. He doesn't look good in this film. He doesn't look good. He doesn't look good at all. Five days later, they drafted him in the first round, right? And so, um, so you know, and I remember like a couple weeks after the draft, my buddy's like, who did you want them to take? You said you were watching a few other players. Who'd you want? Oh, to take? I don't Eddie remember. George? Who, I'd have to go back and look at the draft. Let me go back. I, I, I'll tell you. I could look it up. Stacked receiver draft, right? Eric Mouds. I think Martin it was a Harrison. DB. I think I liked a DB. Moosin Muhammad. Um, let me just check the draft real quick. But anyway, 96, Eric Moulds right? was in that draft. Yeah, that was 96, me, right? That was the Keyshawn was Johnson for, or was that 95? It's NFL draft. 90, was 95 Keyshawn Johnson? No, yeah, no, no 96. This is Keyshawn okay, Johnson. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what uh, I thought. I like the I DB. There was a Bob DB. Bob books in the memory. Uh, who was it that I liked? It wasn't uh, the guy I liked wasn't good either. Uh, I don't think. Wait, wait, he went in the second round though. Lawyer Malloy? Uh, no. Was he in that? He was in that draft, wasn't he? Yeah, Molds, it was. Molds was the 24th pick, Eric Molds. Um, 96. Yeah. He said he liked a DB. Let's go to it that draft. DB. It was a DB. DB that I liked. Let me see. Maybe I thought he went in the 20s or in the 30s. All right. I got it pulled up. Jerome Woods? No, it was. Uh, who did I like in that draft? No, it wasn't Jerome Jerry. Woods. It wasn't Jerome Woods. It was the next guy after Lawyer Malloy. Who was the next? Gerard, um, no, not Gerard Cherry. It wasn't Gerard Cherry. You just seem like a Dedrick, Dedrick Mathis guy. He <laughs> no. said he wasn't that good. Walt Harris no. played a lot of years. No, it wasn't Walt Harris. God, I forget. God, now it's like, now none of these names. Oh, it was, I, 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 it was Brian Dawkins. I like Brian Dawkins. This is uh. what, and he, no, he wound up being good. Okay, so I like Brian Dawkins, but I'm like, yeah, but he can't really cover it. I wouldn't take him in the first round, right? And that, that's what I said. I'm like, you know, I like this guy because I liked him as a hitter, but I did. I go, I look at this guy, and I'm watching these hits. But I go, you know, I don't like him in the first round. I really don't like him in the first round. And then I said I like the, the, the guy from A&M. Um, so we're debating between the – there's a little DB from A&M that was in this draft. Um, do you see him on here somewhere? Mickens, maybe? He goes, somebody named Mickens. Anyway, so I go, I, you know, I really like the safety, but he, but I, can't, I don't think he can cover, and I like this kid Mickens. Anyway, I was wrong. Uh, other, Well, I mean, I was right on the safety, but I was wrong because I ultimately said that I like the corner. He, They went with Reg. With, yeah, uh, Ray Mickens. He was the pick right after Brian Dawkins. There yeah, you go. Yeah, so I said I liked Mickens. And I partially because I'm an AM fan and this and that. But um, but I really liked him and I liked I thought he was quick and I there was but I didn't like Dudley. And he's like, Why don't you like Dudley? I'm like, Well, this is the biggest game of his year, and he's he's dropping every pass there is in this game. And he's like, Yeah, but he stretches the seam and he's got unbelievable speed. Do you know what this kid ran and all this stuff? <laughs> and I'm like, Yeah, okay, all right. So I <laughs> and then so they wind up taking Ricky Dudley, and like the next couple weeks later. He's like, yeah, Al was asking who was that young kid you were watching uh, watching film with, uh, you know, because he, he, he thought Dudley was the greatest thing ever. And um, and he's like, you know, it's Larry Kruger, and we work together in the Canadian League and so on and so forth. Um, anyway, but then Dudley, I don't know how long it took for them to realize that Dudley sucked. But basically, the guy said, I want what you, Al, I want what you want. So I'm just saying that I've, I've, I've always sat in that kind of perspective of, Tell me ahead of time. Anybody can tell you after who they like. Tell me ahead of time. So I, I, I'm always in that mode. So I'm much more about, hey, if you don't tell me ahead of time, what difference does it make? Everybody's got 2020 hindsight. The guys who are really genius, the Ron Wolfs of the world, can tell you in March who should be drafted in April. And then those guys, you know, those are the what's, guys who really. What's know. the question then? What do you want me to tell you? Because when no, I asked saying, you to tell me, you were like, is, "Oh, I think he'll start this much. Call. I think he'll start this." I really much, think. I really think. In, instead if of think, in, instead of let's see, me, we're eventually going to see. Like there's there's people that will go, "Well, we'll see." Well, of course we're going to see, unless yeah, the world ends. I think so. What do so you we're, we're like, going to see. Like, so do I all, think he's going to be a multi-year starter for the 49ers? Yeah, I'd like yeah, to know. I like, I'd like people to be on the record and just ride with it. If you think the guy, if you're like me and you think he's going to be good, just say so. And if you're wrong, you're wrong. And if you're in another camp and you're like, he's not the guy long term, then in my mind, you don't believe in him. And then just ride with that. 
But so don't be like, though? well, I like him today because today is good, but then I don't believe in him long term. It's like, what are you yeah, saying? You You're just basically you saying he's, he's the best say, they got you right do now. That. No, you can do that because he is playing good right now, but that doesn't mean you believe in him long term. Larry, the, they're two different things. They're so why why do you think things. he's playing good now, but you don't believe in him long term? Because he's surrounded by Buku talent. Like there's so, so you're really saying that he's a product of his ta- of the talent around him. A he's big not. Person, yes, I'm not yeah. saying he can't be a. Well, everybody starter. is to some degree, I, right? Of course, everybody. Yes, of course, everybody is. Of course, everybody is, Larry. Yes, everybody is to some degree, but <laughs> there is an element where he's going to have to get paid a lot of money, and that talent's not going to be there. And when it does, that's when I question things. Now, we've seen it in small sense, and it hasn't looked great. So, I mean, I'm just saying but, that if you really look right at yet, these I don't great, know if I'm right. Every good quarterback in the league right now that you would already make a call on. Okay, let, let's do it like this. They all have let's good players like around them, right? Oh, okay. They all have good weapons. Like, listen, listen let's do it good like weapons. this. When, when the 49ers lost CMC and Debo Samuel, Okay. A lot of people are like, well, he, I mean, pff, what do you expect? He didn't have CMC and Debo Samuel. Okay. Well, if I took Brandon Ayuk and I took uh, Jordan Mason or whoever you prefer, do you prefer Mason or Mitchell? Mason. Okay. So if I took Ayuk, Mason, and Kittle and said, okay, let's, let's look at the Ravens' weapons and compare them. Let's compare Edwards and Flowers and uh, their tight end. Versus what the 49ers have. Uh, Yeah, Andrews. Or if I look at the Chiefs and say, let's look at uh, whatever receiver you think is the best over there. None of them are very good. And Pacheco and Kelsey versus these three players. Like, those three players are, some for some teams, good teams, the most that they have. That's what they have every week. Like, that's as good as it gets. So if they lose one or two of their best players, now all of a sudden they're down to just... Brandon Ayuk, no Kittle, and no Mason. They don't lose their two best players and go, oh, we well, still have Kittle and Ayuk and Mason. Most teams don't have that luxury. That's not a real thing across the league. It is for the 49ers, though. So, yeah, if I take Kelsey away from, from uh, Mahomes, maybe it's not going to look as good. But who the F else is there? There is nobody else there if I take Kelsey away. That's the difference. We saw Mahomes lose the Super Bowl. He still had awesome weapons. He just didn't have tackles. Yeah, so it's and, a team again, game. So it's like Larry, you're not going to be wrong if he doesn't win a Super Bowl. I'm not going to. I'm not going to. I'll tell you what is not going to happen for me. I'm not going to come back in five years if somehow we remember this conversation. And I doubt we will, but maybe we do. I'm not going to come back in five years and be like Larry. You know, um, Brock Purdy is playing great football, and by every measure, he's still playing good. But you were wrong, and I was right because he didn't win a Super Bowl. Like, I'm not going to say that. I don't care if he wins a Super Of course, I want them to win a Super Bowl. Sure. But I'm not going to judge him if they don't win a Super Bowl and say he's not a good quarterback. There's lots of good quarterbacks that I think play in this league right now that haven't won a Super Bowl. There's bad quarterbacks that have won a Super Bowl. That's not my end-all, be-all. It's just like, I'm just saying, compare him to Herbert, for example, who has weapons, has size, has arm strength. Everybody okay. thinks he's good. So are you Doesn't taking him win over games. Herbert? Are you taking him over Herbert? I mean, I, 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 Herbert has something really, really special. Um, as far Are as you a skill taking set. him over Herbert, it's a yes or no. It's very simple. Because I, I tell you right now, I am absolutely not taking Brock Purdy over Herbert. Not even I, close. I mean, you know, I mean, I haven't studied Herbert because I'm not a Charger fan and I don't study Her- Herbert. But I've got lots of concerns about Herbert. Okay. So you're, lots of you're taking him over Herbert. Herbert, but you reserve the right to, to I've look studied over the film. Brock more than I've studied Herbert. Okay. I haven't, I I'll say this. There's a flaw to Herbert. I just haven't put my finger on exactly. But for the guy is. that wants opinions from everybody else, doesn't have an opinion. When I ask him a direct question, we're, that seems but we're a little... studying this player weekly all the time. We've watched this guy a ton. Okay. A yeah, ton. but when I but when I asked you, I said, "Larry, give me." So you're saying he's going to start for eight years? You were like, "Well, eight years is a long time." I mean, dude. eight you years. Mahomes has not played eight years yet. No, but when you say, "Well, you got to tell me right now if he's good," like when you say, "Oh, if he's that guy," in my mind, that's what I'm thinking. If you say, all I'm is saying he is, that based guy, on what you know right now, 
Do you yeah, think but you're these asking look me if he's... long term? And I would say yes. Okay, long term. What is long term? How many years? I, I would say you know, the, in a sport like football, you know, you got to say three to five years because it's just you know, it's just okay. So it's, you're it's, asking a lot of injuries. I mean, the, the average career is not even years that long. From, you're asking me at the minimum three years. Three from to now, five do years I think from Brock now, Brock Purdy will be the starting quarterback. Yeah, of the you're 49ers. saying Niners. No. Three years from now, right now, based on how he's played through twelve games, yeah, I do think you would say yes. The opportunity okay. to last, yeah. And Jesse, what would you say to that? As what the was starter the question? of the 49ers, three to five years, three to five years from now, will Brock Purdy still be the starting quarterback for the Niners? Three to year, three years, I could see it. Five years, no. Okay, so that's, something's going to happen. As definitive in the as it gets, Krug. That's as definitive right. as it gets. All right, fair enough. Fair enough. All right, um, now, now, how about you? Come on. I say yes. I say yes. No, no, I, no, no, no. Purdy yes, or Herbert, yes. come on. Three come to on. five years, yes. Eight years. I mean, come on. Eight years is a long time. Eight years is a long time. Well, would you guys at least yeah. admit eight years is a long no, time? No, of course. That's yeah. why I That's why I refuse to answer the question in the first place. Because I yeah. thought the premise was asking me, do you want me to tell you if he's going to be the starter eight but, years I mean, from let's now? Just like, take like, the years out of it. If you just, let's take all the years out of it. If Do you believe... That Brock Purdy, in my opinion, we're having a debate like, do you think Brock's real or not? And if you say that you think he's real, then you're in one camp. If you think that he's not, then you're in another camp. I think he's real. And that's why when Shanahan said he's the real deal, a lot of people push back. And He's physically seen him in person, Vish. He knows he's alive. Oh, he's, he's, he, I, think got he, cells? I think he is the real deal. Yes, I do. I do. <laughs> and maybe I'll be wrong. Maybe I'll be wrong. And there'll be plenty of people that will be tell me I'm wrong from wrong. But what's what's the real deal? Like the real deal is that hey, this guy is the real deal, which means that he's a starting quarterback in the NFL. That makes him a real deal. He can be a long term starting quarterback in the NFL. That makes him a real deal because that is something that I can get on board. But if the real deal means that hey, when we talk about the quarterbacks in the NFL. It's Patrick Mahomes, Brock Purdy, Josh Allen. Like, those are the names we're saying five years from now. I, I can't answer that question today. I need a larger sample of Brock Purdy because those guys have that standing with us right now because they've had multiple years where they've been at the top of the league. This guy has not completed one year of starting. Two games from now, he will have. Um, over two years. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> you won't even be taking that sample size. Two, two more games, 17 games. Uh, by the way, uh, I did cash tonight. I took Buffalo and the over and uh, on the teaser. What was the score? And it was 24 18 Buffalo. Back so cover. I had Bills minus two and a Get half on the teaser. <laughs> oh, you had over 35 and a half. Dude, so that, that Bucks offense is kind of brutal to watch. Yeah, Baker's I didn't get in. Did you guys watch a minute of this? Uh, yeah, while you guys no. were arguing, I was having some popcorn enjoyment. <laughs> By the way, yeah, which, chat, one, the chat was undefeated <laughs> comedy, but the second thing to watch was the uh, was the game. All right, we're an hour and forty two minutes into this. Um, I'm really glad that I made my kids uh, dinner beforehand. By the yeah. way, yeah, and you haven't gotten to a single dinner? super chat, so now we're like <laughs> we, we have super chats oh. from a conversation we had an hour and a half ago, and be like, I don't even know what he means, dude. I did a stream with Lombardi a few weeks ago where we did the entire stream, and he never read the super chats at all. I'm like, Dave, what about all those people and all the donations? There's only like three super chats in the history of. Uh, me streaming that I've ever not written, not read. It's just always like right at the buzzer. They throw it in too. And you're like, Oh, I missed yeah. That. Or if you're just, <laughs> I mean, brother Bob went off on Damon the other day and I love brother Bob, but I, he couldn't, I mean, I, I you know, he was really I, I, pissed I, off limits. brother Bob. Come on, man. There were some limits, <laughs> brother Bob, where, you know, we're going to have to meet face to face or you're going to have to deal. You, you, you know, don't, you don't, I, there's certain topics that I just won't go to. Uh, he went he went full bore on it and I had to I had to just and I was against my better judgment, brother Bob, because I love you. And uh, whether you love me or not back, um, I think you're a great chatter, but uh, I just couldn't I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. It was, it was too it was too negative, too polarizing, too, too uh, hostile, um, not towards me, but towards uh, D. Bruce. Now, whatever. Um, and I and when D. Bruce attacks, that's on him. And I told him that. I said, hey, look, if you're going to attack guys that I stream with, whether it be Grant, Jesse, anybody else, you're on your fucking own. And I told him that. So that's where we're at. Um, okay. Now, a couple things I do want to get to. 
Steve Wilkes. Chat. Steve Wilkes. We're going to get to the Super Chats. <laughs> Should we go Super Chats and then Steve yes, Wilkes? Yes, yeah, we'll get to the Super chats. chats. All right, let's go to the Super Chats. All right. We can't let him keep waiting. Jesus. Come on, man. <laughs> Crying out loud. All right, let's get to the Super Chats. TK Yang, he says, has this team become too reliant on Purdy? Maybe they should play Darnold just to prove they can grind oh. out a win. Whoever plays quarterback. Do not play Darnold if you don't have to play Darnold. Do not do that. He's hearing yeah. ghosts. I, I, it is Halloween. I, think, I don't. I think there's a lot of people. Let me, let me ask you guys this. Do you believe that there's any side of Kyle Shanahan that wants to play Sam Darnold over Brock Purdy? Because there's a lot of people suggesting that is what's going on here. That this is like Brock. Is he really hurt? Is he not? You know, all this is kind of dubious. I think Shanahan talked about Sam Darnold, like made the Steve Young comparison. I think he just wants to run to Sam Darnold. Is there I, any side of you that thinks that Kyle wants to run from Purdy to Darnold? I don't think Kyle wants to run from Purdy to Darnold, but I think Kyle really likes Darnold. How about that? I don't think like the two things. Are, it's like last year when Joe Buck and Troy Aikman said that Kyle told uh, um, them that he has never wanted to see a third string quarterback play more than he had wanted to see Brock Purdy. And this was in the Arizona game on Monday night when they played uh, with Jimmy at quarterback and they were playing really well with Jimmy at quarterback at the time. And he said that. So I think he really likes Sam Darnold, but I think that there's been a lot of speculation on the 49ers are doing and saying this, but Kyle really thinks this for the last two years. And Kyle has pretty much kind of been aligned with what the 49ers say and do publicly. So I don't know that there's this hidden agenda there with how they tell us what's going on publicly, but it's quite clear he loves Sam Darnold, and I wouldn't be shocked if he wants to see what he could do with Sam Darnold. Jesse, and I don't I think don't, that has anything to do with Purdy. I, I don't... <laughs> there's, like, two sides of this, right? Like, there's the... the People have come out and said, I don't even think he has a concussion. This is all a big... Right, it's all a big theory, ruse. Right? No, I'm not in that camp at all. But am I in the camp of if Sam Darnold did play this week and play really good, that Maybe Kyle Shanahan might question things for a bye week. Yeah, I am in that camp because he thinks of Sam Darnold way differently than I think of Sam Darnold. I Me look too. at this and go, Brock Purdy is clearly the better quarterback than Sam Darnold. <laughs> Sam Darnold is proven. We talk about the three-year playing rule. I've seen enough of Sam Darnold. All right, you want a definitive answer on Sam Darnold? Sam Darnold in this system with these players, sure. I think he could look good for a short stint. But long-term... I'm out on Sam Darnold. I have seen enough of Sam Darnold to definitively say I think I'm right on that one. I, I was never in on. I was play. never in on Sam Darnold. Ne um, neither was never. I. But me but, neither. You know, it, whatever. Either way, either way though. That being said, Kyle Shanahan looks at Sam Darnold very different. That he was he offered a first round pick, twelve overall, to the Jets for Sam Darnold. And then the Jets declined him because they wanted Zach Wilson and he had a shoulder injury and they were like, well, we don't know. We might have to keep Sam. We're not sure. And then they went back to the 49ers. At that point, the 49ers had already moved up to three and they traded him to Carolina. Okay, so we already know that Shanahan just two years ago did think he was worth a first round pick. We know that he called him the next Steve Young. We know that Matt Mayoko, who had never seen Sam Darnold in person throw a football, <laughs> right. came out and said that he is the best yeah. throw of the football the 49ers have ever he had. He might be. He might yeah, be. He yeah. might be. That didn't come from <laughs> Matt Mayoko, by the way. That didn't come from Matt course, Mayoko. Yeah. We know that that came from inside the building. And we also know that Kyle Shanahan... Well, the guy said it wasn't that crazy in the state right, of the franchise, sure. right? The but, guy who might have told Mike Matt Mayoko about it, Kyle Shanahan, was like, I don't think that's crazy right. when you see how Sam throws it. He throws it as good as anybody. But that being said, he also did two other things. He signed him immediately as soon as free, agents, free agency started. And he, we know, is looking at everybody else across the league and thinks he's smarter than everybody else. That is not a Kyle Shanahan thing. That is a head coach thing. They all think they're better than the last guy. And he's looking at Sam Darnold with all the physical traits and going, that guy was an idiot who coached him. That guy was an idiot who coached him. Let me get my hands on Sam and I'll show you how good this kid really is. He really believes that. So Kyle isn't looking at this through a lens that you, Vish, myself, and Larry are looking at it through. He's looking at it saying, I mean, pretty looks pretty good to me. Played pretty good. 
has all the physical talents. I've always liked him. Let me sit on this for a week. Like, I really do believe that. Larry Kruger might be the best post-game show host in Niner history. Might be. Not saying might he was. Not saying he was. <laughs> he might be. Beyond piss, brother Bob. Did Brock Beyond Purdy piss. have a concussion against that. the Browns, too? Um, oh, I get you. Back in that discussion about the picks. Um, yeah, well, he, 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 to me, the Browns, and you know, here's the other one on this one. That's very frustrating. I would then watch the Browns Colts the next week. Oh and the Colts just kind of ripped them up. Gardner Minshew look great. So I don't know. I don't know what to say, but the Browns, the day that the Niners played them sure look damn good. And I love the trio of Ward and Newsome and Emerson love miles Garrett. He's clearly the defensive player of the year. Um, I love JOK always have. So I'm a little, and I thought they had uh, a great game plan, but hey, Larry, Larry, go great. into your, go into your settings. Okay. And Sorry. under, well, I think it's, there might be another settings. You can choose to have the screens jump up when the super chats come. So it doesn't go over vicious face. What do you mean? Oh, how do I, what do I do? Layout? Yeah. Hey, Larry. Yeah, uh, go into your settings, and then yeah. I think it might be layout. Yeah, is there a layout in there? Yeah, cropped yeah. layout, group layout, spotlight layout, news there's layout. A, there's like a little check mark that'll say, you know, move with, with the chat or something, and you can check. check Three mark. man, custom layout. There's no, 15 no, no. of these. Settings the settings is at the very bottom. It says, like, mute, stop cam, settings, present, leave studio. No, I got very, I'm very in bottom. settings. But is okay. then I'm gonna you keep in, with the super chats. I'm gonna go, I'll go check it out. I'll tell you what it is. All right, but tell me what it is. This is like getting removed from the show. <laughs> Seriously, I can't see right, the beard, continue. damn it. Yeah, come All on, right. come on. I've been working on it for a good like week and a half. Vish, or you know, God, that does I do feel like we're kind of hosing Vish there. It's like Anyway, he pissed off Brother Bob. Vish is back. Purdy's pimp. Give all my super super chat money to nails and vish. Oh, that's mean spirited, man. <laughs> That's right. You don't think yeah. I deserve it? I, I think I deserve it. I've I've created an argument Krug, that's next, lasted an next, hour and fifty one. Next days. time I see you, let's go to the vending machine. You can buy me a bag of Skittles. Come for on, that man. Ninety nine. Well, well, come on, brother Bob. I gotta give away my super chat. I mean, he is beyond pissed off. Come on, Krug. Crow Larry, said, "Larry, I got it. I got okay. it. Go to go it? to settings. All right, hold on, hold on. I'm going to settings, and then go to general." Go to general. I'm there. And then general. Shift up videos with comments and banners. It's clicked, but it is. But clicked. unclick it. No, no, no. You want it clicked. It should be shifting him up automatically. Let me try. I'll unclick it and we'll see if it changes. Nope. nope. Wait a second. Let me try it again. Damn it. <laughs> All right. That's fine. Just continue. Whatever it's it is. Fine. You it is. Can no, it isn't what it is. I need perfection. Krug, just I, I've been putting a picture of you in a tight Warriors jersey as my profile picture on a thumbnail for the last like five shows we've done. We can take this one. This is that karma. That ain't fucking <laughs> this right. This is karma. That ain't fucking right. I'll tell you that right now. All right, uh, let's go. Come on. That's just that's just mean spirited of you. I'm gonna talk to my agent. All right, Crow says, please <laughs> help me understand something. Why would Bosa or any defensive end in a wide nine defense be straight in front of the Vikings right tackle instead of to the outside? He's asking about wide nine alignments. There's the esoteric. That's Crow. <laughs> well, he shouldn't be. Um, but just because like you play wide nine, it doesn't mean every snap you're necessarily in it either. So you can show oh, look different at that. fronts. Maybe it worked. Maybe it worked. No, no, no that's just a short one. Oh, I, you yeah. know why it's not working is because Kevin made a custom layout. I think. Oh, I look at that! Custom yeah. layouts. Kevin good. screwed us. Yeah, yeah come yeah, on, thanks, Kevin. Kevin. Uh, Way yeah, to go, thanks, Kevin. He's a he's a system kid. I've got two <laughs> others I can go to. Knox. <laughs> no, well, three. He's, he's maybe enhanced by you and your other kid and the other kid. <laughs> I've got another kid who's cheaper, better, and he <laughs> gives me less lip. Knox underscore three two three says, "Hey, here's a deuce." Dropping a deuce on us. Hey, so I'm not afraid to admit that I'm a system content creator. I'm being carried <laughs> by you two. Yeah. No, seriously. You, what are you talking about? You got a fucking neon light. You're like the right. king. As far as I'm right. concerned, you're the goddamn king. Right. <laughs> All right. Brother Bob, Vish Nails. How many excuses can Purdy's pimp give for Brock Purdy? That's old. No, there's no credibility in that comment. <laughs> I don't even know who this brother Bob is actually anymore. <laughs> 
All right, here we go. Let's cover Vish again. Um, Purdy rule. Ban the quarterback sneak because Brock Purdy got a concussion. I like it. <laughs> Sounds good to me. They I would do it that. if it was Brady. I hate that call anyway. All right, here we go. Uh, Brother Bob emptying the clip piece by piece. Nails with facts. Fire. Purdy's pimp should apologize to Ryan again. Sorry, hey, Ryan. Leave, leave that out of it. They got their own issues. That's not, we don't <laughs> I need to get apologize to him, but he blocked stuff. me, and he blocked my son. He's blocked us all at this point. Come on, Rye. Well, you do have two other fun. sons. We're just having fun. I haven't been told we're through since my high school girlfriend until Rye. 808 Niners says, without the Trent, they can't, without, without the Trent, without Trent, they can't run. I don't care what Brock Purdy's stats were during the first three quarters. When it counted, he came up short. He's good, but not great. But what if he's that a stature joke? Well, well, it's because because the people have this impression in their head that Joe Montana and Tom Brady came through every single time at the end of the game, and they never failed. It's like the old Michael Jordan thing. Michael Jordan has never missed a clutch shot in his career. He's never had a bad clutch game. He's never had a bad closeout game. It's just how he could deify them. All Purdy needs is a couple of iconic playoff performances, and then he'll get the impression that he never fails late in close games. Like, I'll give you an example. You talked about Justin Herbert, right? Something's not right. You know, who leads the fourth, you know who leads the NFL in fourth quarter comeback since Justin Herbert has come into the NFL? Justin Herbert? Justin Herbert. Yeah. It was weird, right? But that's because he did. But, I mean, that's, to, that's, to, that's uh, you know, doesn't really represent things because, like, Brock Purdy is last in the NFL in fourth quarter uh oh, no, pass no, no. But, but that's what i'm saying like but it doesn't just going to mean that you're you're you didn't win the game the first three quarters in a way kind of kind of yeah. i mean it also means that he plays well in close games but then his criticism seems to be that he doesn't come through in close games right here it was like oh purdy didn't come through on that one drive good not great definitive we know it like nah he had one drive where he didn't come through those picks were were pretty alarming, though. I, I do wonder now about the concussion and what the impact was, but who knows? We'll, we need to see more. Uh, I, we can't make an evaluation until we see more. True. Uh, well said. <laughs> well said. The line of the All show. Right. Brother Bob uh, says, Purdy's pimp, you just said get off the fence. That's pressure. Yeah, right. dude. Putting All more right. pressure on us than the Niners defense put on Kirk Cousins. <laughs> That was so frustrating to watch, by the way. Watching he Kirk looked Cousins. like Peyton Manning, didn't he? He was Dude, dicing the greatest. Up. Is, yeah, he literally was Peyton Manning. <laughs> he was calling their defense at the line of scrimmage. He was standing there every throw. He was not missing. I never felt like the Niners were going to win that game. Never. Really? I did. I, I really felt did. throughout I like they're like going to the come through. They're not going <laughs> to lose two in a row. They're going to come I through. Do. This I is do. like, there's no way they're going to let this happen. They're going to yeah. find themselves in this game. Yeah. They're going to come through. And I also thought there's no way Cousins could continue this. He was playing at a godly level, and it didn't change from start to finish. In fact, the Niners only even got the ball back because Greg Joseph missed a kick, not even because they stopped Kirk Cousins. I don't even know who said that because I'm looking at a super chat. I it seemed like it came out of left field. That could have been my kid. That could have been my neighbor who was shouting it from the. I, I can't see who's talking. Dazzo, Vish, at least if you could look over the chat. Yeah. <laughs> Do you prefer Just, that? Yeah. He's like, like the what? He's like the guy peeping, off of like he's uh, like peeping. He's home a peeping improvement. Fish. He's the guy off home improvement. Like he only see his eyes over the fence. <laughs> hey, what'd you pay for that mower? <laughs> hey, Daza0187, why does there have to be extremes on Brock Purdy? He's a good quarterback, but I still don't think he's a franchise quarterback, although I still could be proven wrong. There you go. All right. Yeah, I just need to be Daza. more accepting. I'm I, I'll tell I, you you guys, I told I gave you my perspective. I told you what I think, and then I've told you why I believe in making a call is because I've just that's kind of what I grew up with. That's kind of like the personnel game is like you make a call, and so I'm. I, I like being on record early, but when you're on record early, you're gonna uh, make more mistakes. By the it's, way, Kruk, it's safer I, to wait. I will say not to rehash that discussion. The premise of what you said, I actually agree with. Like the premise of people giving takes based on how they're being responded to, rather than that being talked about. Like, yeah, that's a fair take. The issue I had is you as Jesse and I. Like, why are people doing that? And like neither Jesse and I can answer for how people 
are shifting their takes. So then we just gave our impression of our own takes based on that. And then that's why it turned into a massive discussion. But really the premise of what you said, yes, I see it too. Like I see it as well. I guess I just ignored and move on. I just don't like, I just don't like that wishy washy. Whoever won is good and whoever loses is bad. That's sports media though. Yeah, I know. I know. I know. And it's the nature of fandom, but it's still (laughs) annoying. Ryan Max is at J uh, J J Nay underscore L S, which is Jesse. Is Grant is a Grant Cone two point oh? Oh, okay. Keeps oh, he's hey, a, oh, wait a second. Listen, hey, I'm getting support. He <laughs> hold on. He he looks at it as hey, a bad Grant, thing. If Grant, that's case, chills, Grant. If that's on, the Grant. case, then I'll be doing this full time at some point. So I'll take it. There you sure. go. And I by the way, Grant um. Uh, 2.0 good thoughts everybody think good thoughts for uh for grants pops who's uh babbling a a little illness Uh, i sent him a tweet hopefully he's getting better but um there you go but ryan ryan like i'm gonna encourage you to do better than this like you gotta be better than this like i've heard this a thousand times like if you really want to insult me like Come up with Dude, something. He should have gone with Junior. Two point oh is a little. Yeah, he like, should have gone with Junior. I've heard it, this a million times, brother. You gotta, you gotta be better than this. And like, if you're gonna the, go for, if you're gonna go the for man. the gusto and pay to like insult somebody, like you gotta, you gotta get, you gotta well, so dig you, deep. You know. Yeah, I mean, here's the thing: well, the three of us have respect for Grant, so you're not really. So I and every, that, you know, here's the beauty of Grant: you have an, he, he, everybody's got an opinion. Nobody, if you say, hey, Grant, nobody goes, eh, I've never really heard of him, and I don't really care. Everybody cares. At the end of the day, the opposite of love is not hate. It's indifference. He lives right. rent-free in people's, I mean, listen, yeah, so that guy clearly hates Grant, but he just paid you $5 to talk about Grant. Make that make <laughs> there sense. There you go. And Grant, Grant you can't have any of it, damn Grant, it. 2.0. Come on, you can't Grant, have any of it. 2.0. Oh, here comes Brother Bob. Damn nails just own Purdy's pimp. 100. Purdy's pimp does that with Lance. What's that? What's that? Literally like what's the uh, what's that? What's that crazy. like emoji at the end there? T receipts. Coffee. I don't know. Receipts. Yeah, receipts. Receipts. Damn you, brother Bob. Can't stand you. Nothing. You're you're good for nothing. Um, pissed off, brother Bob. Purdy's pimp. Have you slept with Purdy? <laughs> Truly sounds like it. LOL. Oh no. Here we go. Sounds like it. Here we go. Come on, brother Bob. Got to keep your S's on sound. Yeah, where's where's the S? Where's the S? I did talk to Brock today, but no, I'm not sleeping with him. You didn't talk to Sam, though. Sam was brushed him off. No, I did talk to Sam, but t- Sam did brush me off. But um, <clears throat> to be honest, they probably kind of both brushed me off. No, I'm just joking. But uh, anyway, it, I, I like both guys. I do. I, I like talking to Sam. Uh, I like talking to Brock. Uh, Brock called me sir, though, which made me feel very old. It's Knees okay, says, sir. Vish, I'm going to need you to calm down. Really riling up Jesse and Larry. Uh, I think that's a joke. I think he's joking. Yeah, yeah. I, I was, dude, the comment section, when you guys were going at it, you guys should go back and read it. There was some <laughs> There Was, some was there gold. good stuff in there? There was some gold. I don't know. I mean, was I it would personal? Was it personal? Did it, no, if it I didn't. Feelings. I, I don't want to. I don't want to so. read it. I didn't think so. I feel like I would have laughed out loud if somebody said it about me. But I've also, I've got, I'm very yeah. sensitive. I don't like to have my feelings hurt. Dazzo said, "Big difference between being good and a franchise quarterback." I agree. Agreed. Kirk Cousins, uh, very good player. I've stood up for Kirk Cousins for about eight years. I feel like I don't think he's a franchise quarterback. Freaking Hall of Famer last Monday. He was uh, brother Bob says, Vish, listen, you must decide now per per Purdy's pimp. Period. <laughs> Make a call. God damn it. Anybody can wait till do you, do you like the weatherman who tells you it's gonna rain tomorrow? Or do you like the weatherman who stands outside while it's raining and says, I think it may rain right now? Well, I like the weatherman who doesn't say it's going to rain, but doesn't tell me when it's going to rain, what it's going to rain. No criteria. He just says it's going to rain. You know who's a fucking fraud? I'll give you the fucking fraud. The West Coast weatherman. Hey, it's going to be partly cloudy on the coast. It's going to be a little warmer inland. It's going to be a little cooler on the coast with some fog. um, And it should be warmer inland. I mean, you could say that every day in San Francisco. It's always the case. Uh, Brother Bob says nails. 
You must slob on the Purdy. Oh, no. whoa. All right. All like right. Purdy's pimp. Oh, period. Come on, come on, this is where Brother Bob gets a little. You're going too children's far, show. man. Like it's Brother Bob. Come on. It's, it's There's a line and he always, you're it's always right. You're like, you're like the Dre Greenlaw of the chat. Yeah. Like you're always on the on the line, yeah. and then it's like, oh, you know what? There's the 15 yard penalty, man. Seriously, like it, you got. He's like Draymond Green, <laughs> you know. He, he he's leading the league, and he's like Rashid Rashid Wallace. Hey, hey, he's hey, getting hey. teed up. He's getting hey, teed up. Crew, crew, you saw that 103, 102. Detroit basketball is back, baby. Kate Cunningham was good. 30. <laughs> hey, and by nine. the way, don't, don't, by don't the way, on a little side great. note, there, little side note, since uh, Vish is a Pistons fan. James Wiseman, three centers played. James yeah, yeah, Wiseman yeah. did not MP. play. Thank God. Thank God. He stinks. He stinks. Dude, what a waste of talent. That guy's 7-1. He's, he speaks Mandarin. He, he, he's he got a jumper. He just can't do it. He just then, can't then play. you'll have a good time playing in China. He's Yeah, maybe seriously. It sounds like it. Knees says Twitter takes are speaks overreactive. Mandarin. More news at 10. <laughs> okay, thank you. That was good. Knees Ryan is solid. I like Aloy it. says you guys are annoying tonight. Yeah, I think he just means me. He, just meant, he meant me. I was annoying. Okay, I I grant. Hey, no, you know we, what? We all got to take. Now, you know that. how my Come wife on. feels. This is our show. You know how my wife feels. That's why she's in Mexico without me. Well, your wife. <laughs> you revealed how you feel today. Well, so. <laughs> could be. A, you know, you never know. It could be a free agent. <laughs> Frank Tom Ocean says, "Great show, gents. As always, thank you. Oh, thank you to the 49ers. Oh, I got you. Hey, Hey, to the 49ers. He wants us to, to toast. The 49ers. You guys have anything to drink? To I the 49ers. Like water. I've got water. water. Yep. Little little toast to the Niners. Um, okay. Brother Bob, I will remind Purdy's pimp he was wrong because he's so obsessed. All right. All right. Fine. Thank you. Thank you. I wonder if he'll be beyond happy at that point. Beyond happy, brother Bob, or he'll continue to be beyond pissed off, brother. Some Bob. guys just make one comment and drop a fifty spot. Brother Bob drops twenty five chats for two bucks each and just yeah, keeps the dialogue. I, I've talked That's, about this before. He's, he's he a dominant. He's dominant. Like a certain other uh, profession. If I go in a dollar at a time, <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> I need those ones in my wallet when I go to the club. Okay, chill, Krug. I Your wife's only on vacation. She's coming back. I need those ones. <laughs> YouTube works in Mexico, Larry. I don't know if you know how the internet works. Yeah, I was but... just there. The internet works there. <laughs> I was told that. She... I was told no. Uh, she's not interested enough in the show. She's just interested in the money from the show. Uh, until, until. <laughs> seriously. Hey, what did you guys hey, talk about? Oh, we talked about how much about, we then? hate you. She didn't even care. She would be like, oh, that's great. That's great. Did you get a lot of super chats? All right. Uh, Bay Area people compare Purdy or Birdie, I know Birdie, to fifty million dollar a year quarterbacks, and then say, "Hey, they have less weapons. Do you want a one million dollar quarterback with fifty million dollars talent, or vice versa?" That is kind of funny in a cap sport. You know, you really probably can't have everything, but um, I hear what you're saying. Guys, following the cap, gotta give them that. Uh, Jimmy Kwan says, here's a five spot. One of the biggest losses was Jimmy Ward. Greenlaw keeps running backs in check. With Ward gone, there's no real heavy hitting in the secondary. Big difference. This might be the best super chat of the night. I, I was one of the wow, questions that I have. Bob, that's personal. That's yeah, personal. yeah, Brother Bob, top this. Okay, shot. You and you're over the line. Um, the run D for the Niners, you add Hargrave, he's not great against the run. You get rid of Tart and Ward, and you replace them with a Fonga and Gibson. That's a negative against the run. Then Greenlaw gets dinged and missed a game. You're losing lots of good run defenders. The Niners, to me, I, I'm a little worried going against Philly that they can't stop Philly's run anymore. I don't know that the Niners have really stopped anybody's run this year. I think that they their offense has scored to a re, to a point where teams have stopped running. Why do I say that? Because I looked at the number of rushing attempts against the Niners. It's like far and away the least in football. Teams aren't even running against the Niners because they're down by so many points for the most part. So are you guys concerned about the run D or not? Yeah, I think you nailed it. The issue isn't the fact that they're giving up so many yards per carry. It's the fact that the last two games we've seen two teams stay consistent with it. To me, Cleveland going three of 12 on third down 
but being able to get off 34 runs, that's wild. And then on the other hand, Minnesota only got off 21 runs, but they were able to stick with the run. And that's similar to the Rams week two, who never gave up on the run either. Um, that to me is the key playing the 49ers because the 49ers defense preys on being able to get you to stop. They stop the run on their way to the quarterback. Philosophically, they've talked about this. They try to force teams to be one dimensional because in cases that you can't run the football, their pass rushers can tee off and therefore dominate the game. But if you can stay consistent and find a way to run the football for them against four quarters and keep them honest, you slow down the pass rush for the entirety of the game and you give yourself a better chance. It's just about whether you can get positives on first and second down running it. Cleveland showed they could. Arizona, to a small extent, showed they could. Minnesota showed that they could. And that's why, to me, the Bengals game will come down to that because Bengals have a horrendous run offense. But the Niners run defense, while it's not terrible, it's not bad, it can be had a little bit. I'm worried if they lose Greenlaw that their run D is going to be a sieve. Jesse, where are you on the Niner run D? How how big of an issue is the Niner run D struggles? Yeah, I mean, it's it's tough because you remember during the preseason, we saw like these major gaffes in the run game. We're like, well, we're kind of worried about it, but it wasn't really against the starter, so we're not really sure. And then it was good. It was really good, actually, for the um, first five weeks of the season. Then it was really bad against the Browns. It started out bad against the Vikings, but if the overall numbers you look at them, you're like, ah, actually, you know, not that bad. Really, I think it was like 76 yards or something like that. So I don't know if I'm like overly concerned about it. I mean, what was it? The 20, I think it was the 2021 49ers started out giving up like 120 plus yards a game for like the first six games, and then they turned it around. So I think they can turn it around first year defensive coordinator uh, with this team. Anyways, I think that there's going to be some growing pains, but I'm not overly concerned just yet. Not yet. Uh, George Kelly, Dr. George Kelly. Do we have a doctor in the house. Dr. Wow. George Kelly has become a YouTube member. Look at Dr. Wow. Kelly. Wow. My favorite. Do you guys ever watch Curb Your Enthusiasm? Have no. you ever seen that show on HBO? Nope. Larry Not David. Yet. It's kind of like Seinfeld, but with swearing. There's a great mm -hmm. scene where he thinks his neighbor is stealing his paper and he confronts him. And he's like, hey, man, you're stealing my paper. And he goes, Larry, I'm a doctor. And he goes, but I think you're stealing my paper. And he's Larry, I'm a doctor. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's this awesome thing. He's staring him down. He's, he's going, I know you're stealing my newspaper, Larry. I'm a doctor. Oh, uh, just next, awesome. next time you and I get into, or I, next time Jesse and you get into an argument, you should just hit him with a Jesse. Jesse, I'm a doctor. I'm, I'm a doctor. doctor. I'm a yeah. doctor. Um, John Muniz has just saw on Twitter rumors of front office not happy with Wilkes. Have you guys heard anything? Also, who are we trading for that would help us out? I, my, I wanted to get to the Wilkes topic. We will get to it, John. Just let me get to the rest of these, and we'll get to the Wilkes. Have you guys seen what he's talking about, rumors of the front office not being happy with Wilkes? I haven't, no. I, I mean, haven't. other than are people taking the comments from Shanahan and like turning that into he's not happy? He's I, not I don't the know. front I gotta office. I got to know what the context is. Yeah, if anybody's got anything on that, uh, let me know, but we're going to, yeah. I'm going to play you the cuts real quick here in a second. Uh, James Foster, what do you guys think of putting Kinlaw on the edge on third down, letting him go bowl in the China shop, use size and strength to put the, the uh, tackles in the quarterback's lap. I, I just don't think there's enough speed there, but it's interesting because he is, if you want a bull rush, he can bull rush a tackle. He's got great strength. If you want to go with like the jumbo lineup, um, I could see that. I, I've been wildly impressed with Randy Gregory through two games. So I would love to see a front four of him, Armstead, Bosa, and uh, get some real work. I think Gregory has really been a bright spot, other than Mitch Wisnowski. Mitch Wisnowski. Well, he's asking is. about Kinlaw. What do you guys? What do you, What are your guys' thoughts on uh, Kinlaw? Kinlaw on the? Yeah, that's what I meant about Kinlaw on the edge. I, that's not something I would like to see. I would like to see Randy Gregory with those three guys. I wouldn't mind seeing Kinlaw in a jumbo package at defensive end in a goal line situation. You know, and that I, that I could I could go for. What I do mean, you think, Jesse? He's their biggest. He's the biggest guy, though, right? Like in a goal yeah. line, you're going to stick your yeah. biggest guy on the edge. Yeah. 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 I don't think it's like a pure pass rusher. I want to see him on the edge in those situations. 
I don't. I, I mean, he would definitely cave it in, but you're talking about speed factor. I mean, there's not a ton of speed there. Titus Moeller says, what are your thoughts on the stat Nick Wright cited? Oh, I love Nick Wright. He's so credible. Uh, the 49ers are 1-38 and 38 under Kyle Shanahan when they trail by five points or more at any point in the fourth quarter. Well, Aren't that's they 0 38 Aren't they 0-38? I thought it was 0-38. It doesn't feel... I will say this. It does not feel when the Niners are down in the fourth quarter that they're going to win. Ever. I never... It hmm. seems like they have to be... They have, they have to be winning. In going into the fourth quarter, and that stat kind of reveals that. I I thought I really thought they were going to win this week. In fact, there was a point where I tweeted out. I said, "You know, good teams find a way to win tough games, and this just seems like one of those games that the 49ers are going to win." I really had that. And then when they missed the field, that was early in the fourth quarter, and then it was like, "Oh gosh, okay." Pretty through the pick, they got the ball back. They can run this thing out. They score a touchdown. It's over. Then they missed the field goal. And I tweeted out again. I'm like, all right, Purdy's got a second chance. Like, I think it's coming. And it just didn't. So, I don't know. I really felt like they were going to win that game on multiple occasions down the stretch. The, so this stat to- feels a little exaggerated to me just because, like, I did, I need some context for that stat. I mean, being down five going into the fourth quarter, that seems like the kind of ridiculous situation that nobody's going to really have a great record now, one in 38, of course, feels drastic, but I, I think that if we got context of, hey, these other coaches are also zero in 20 something, whatever, in these situations, and perhaps I should have looked it up. I didn't know we would get this question, and I wasn't fully aware of this stat, but I, I would need the context of that before I decide whether this is good or bad, because on its face value, sure, it can be that, but. Again, being down five in the fourth quarter does not seem like a situation any team is really successful in. Maybe Patrick Mahomes is, but it's a lot of games, though. I mean, you would think they would have pulled out one or two in there. Uh, Brother Bob says, true. If you want to insult nails, call him Kruger. Oh, that's funny. That is funny. I'm going to have to say that's the best chat of the show. Sorry. (laughs) You're really starting to piss me off. Beyond pissed off Krieger versus beyond pissed off brother Bob. You know, how dare you say that? All right. Jeff says, we all agree that this Bengals game D line must step up and get sacks all day. Uh, Five or more. The Bengals O line is horrible. So I'll be worried if they don't. Uh, The Bengals uh, or Zeus Brown, is he out? He's listed. Uh, I don't know if he's questionable or out, but I thought he was listed as questionable. I didn't know he was ruled out already. Well, I'm just looking at one thing that hasn't been read showing that he's not playing. I don't know. We'll see. I, it's, you know, it's been, forget it's time. It's beyond time for this D line to get it rolling. Um, it, you know, they, they, come on. When, when they signed Javon Hargrave, we all envisioned jailbreak on the quarterback. It hasn't been that way. The mm-hmm. 49ers have, um, in sacks, they have 15 sacks. They're 18th in the NFL in sacks. That's not what. That's not what they signed up for. I mean, you, he you was limited in practice envisioned? yesterday. It looks like he's going to play Krug. You know what he's else we play? envisioned yeah. when we signed Hargrave? Who's that? That the Eagles' defensive line all of a sudden wasn't going to be good, and that's not true either. Right. Yeah, yeah. Talk about hey, hey, some idiot came on here and Larry Kruger said, let's have definitive takes. So some idiot came on here over the offseason was like, Yeah, I don't think the Eagles are gonna be as good. I wonder who that idiot was. Don't remember him. <laughs> Look at them. Look at Jalen co- Carter. Look at Jalen co- Carter. Let's cover him both the super chat real quick. And we don't have to then we'll act like he's not here. I don't know who said that, but I don't want that guy <laughs> on my show. Right. 808 Niner says, no, Krug and Vish said Brock Purdy played good <laughs> against the Vikings. They lost, and he threw two bad picks. I'm saying if you don't win, nothing else matters. He, oh, he, did, play, he did play good. Shanahan, forget Vish and Krug. Shanahan said he played great. I'm not as I'm not as big on the, if he didn't win, nothing else matters. I mean, yes. Wait, what do you mean forget Shanahan? We it, said it. It comes no, down to wins Sh- and I mean, losses. Forget us. No, Shanahan said it. It comes down to wins and losses as far as a team, of course, but I don't – I'm not going to – just the week before, I didn't say that Moody lost them the game. And this week, I didn't say that Brock Purdy was the only reason that they lost. Like, yes, they had a chance, 
and it didn't he didn't come through much like Moody didn't make the kick the week before but I I don't think that either one of them were the sole reason that they lost either of those games you gave up 478 yards you couldn't get off the field on third down I mean Brock Purdy contributed to the loss with those picks but I mean the defense lost him that game come on I, I think at least that's what I that's how I'm going to remember it um brother Bob says there's there's the 15 yarder ha 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 <laughs> he's talking about his his penalty because he's always close to the line oh. Dre Green what are those emojis chat. what's what are those emojis he's that's a, big, a he's big on emojis it's like a skull and a coffin deal on emojis it's a skull and a coffin. Well, he He's needs dead. to get you involved in that deal. A skull and a coffin? <laughs> yeah. Damn. You got great eyes. I can't I can't see those emojis. Uh, we got Ryan Holmes. John's brother says here's a couple bucks. Thank you. <laughs> Ryan Holmes. Realistic expectations for the trade deadline. Okay, why don't, why don't we hit that? What do you guys think? Realistic. Everybody's, and people are talking Sertan. People are talking all these big names. I did a video on this today. Uh, guys that um, that I think are realistic. I'll I'll give you mine after you give me yours. I think guys that I look at are Dante Jackson, Darnay Holmes, Garrett Bowles. Darnay Holmes. Mm -hmm. Tell uh, me more about Darnay Holmes. He's a corner for the Giants. Okay. Okay. He's had he not a little he's bit of high. a down year this year, but he's had some it's good a, years prior to it's this. A deep pull. Um, okay. I would say Garrett Bowles is possibility. I think Montez Sweat, they're probably poking around over there and Daniil Hunter. Um, that that's probably the five that I could give you off the top of my head. Yeah. I mean, I got? remember we did this early in the year and I said Jalen Johnson is a possibility. I don't think that one's a possibility anymore. He's kind of priced himself to me out I of their range. I would love to get Jalen Johnson though. Yeah, too, but, but I mean good. business. Business wise, with Jalen Johnson at the time, why it made sense to me is you trade a third or fourth for him and he walks for a fourth comp. I don't know that you're getting him for a third or fourth with the way he's played this year. I think he's worth the second. And so that's where I do like the names you suggested. I'm less thinking about names and more thinking about kinds of players. I think that depth and ideally younger development players make sense. The Niners need their draft picks more than ever now that a lot of their roster is highly paid. They have to fulfill their depth with young, talented draft picks that are cheap. So therefore, they can't just afford to trade two ones for Patrick Sertain, especially when they have to pay him. So those are the kind of names I'm thinking of as well. And then Daniel Hunter is obviously the one that's like, oh, if they could make like a one, just dig in and get a move. He's the guy. But I don't know that that makes sense because I think Randy Gregory is their big bite of the apple there. So I think, again, guys like Darnay Holmes, Dante Jackson, those are probably the ones that are along this conversation i like joey nichols though joey nichols i like his, his idea he <laughs> says so oh he said mahomes too <laughs> yeah, would, yeah. Would, would, would we take mahomes over purdy what are we thinking i don't i don't know i gotta see more film on mahomes i don't watch him much but we're getting uh <laughs> we're ah you like what i did ah, look, getting, at that, we're, look at that we're getting Pat Mahomes, Justin Jefferson, Sertan, Miles Garrett, and Chris Jones, according to some Dude, people. wow. They could they get that, but they can't get Aaron Donald? Or fire John Lynch tomorrow if he can't get Aaron Donald with that all. You know, it's funny. We we used to play this game, and it was kind of a fun game. We'd have like a a, a draft, like you know, like you we're you know, some let's say Vish goes first, Jesse goes second, I go third, and we draft. To, and we name names and we go like three, four, five rounds. And then we see who's, who's, you know, who's more correct as far as feel for this thing. Um, if I was going, I like Dante Jackson as well. The name that I think I could really see the Niners going after, I think they really want a difference maker. Um, I think Kenny Moore from the Colts makes a okay, lot of second, a, great a lot of sense. Yeah. He's only 28. He's a premier slot corner. He's a free agent to be. I think because of that, the cost is going to be reasonable. Um, Ballard never uses the franchise tag, so he's probably not going to be able to keep Kenny Moore. And I, I just think Kenny Moore is a elite slot guy, and that would be the guy that I think I could see them going for on the back end. Dante Jackson's nice, veteran depth. Maybe for a sixth or a seventh. Kenny Moore is more like a fifth. Um, I think Starter. maybe a fourth. 
Yeah. As far as, you know, the cost going back, Kenny Moore would be on my list. Jeremy Chin is still on my list because I think that he'll get healthy from that quad. And I think now after watching Goddard and Kelsey, man, you got to be able to shut down the tight end if you want to beat the those two teams and win the Super Bowl. So I think Jeremy Chin is still live, especially since Fitterer and Lynch, um, you know, have hooked up on multiple deals. And then uh, the other name that is intriguing to me, there's two D linemen, Montez Sweat. I've been talking about since the summer. He's only 27. Um, I really like Montez Sweat. I mean, the guy is, is is you know, Kaseric. I think the Niners love Montez Sweat. Kaseric coached him in the Senior Bowl. The Niners brought him in for a pre-draft visit. Um, I don't know who's going to be available, but if the commanders want to move Montez Sweat, I think the Niners are going to pounce on Oh, on they're sweat. taking calls on Sweat. Did they you are steal taking Brown calls right on there? Sweat. I like Montez Sweat. I think I think Kenny Moore, Montez Sweat, Dante Jackson, Jeremy Chin. But the other one that I think is kind of a sleeper guy that I could see the Niners going for is Leonard Williams. Just because he is so scheme versatile and he can do both. He can play the run. He can he can rush the quarterback. Um I, they're, I the, the Giants are going absolutely nowhere. Though. What's that? I think he's truly a five technique. I love the so Kenny Moore, I love. That's a great call on, on your part. I just think Leonard Williams is a very funky scheme fit for the 49ers. I agree he can play there, but he's more suited to be a 3-4-5 technique, in my opinion, than he is to being a true three technique or a nose or a shade nose. But, you know, the thing about Leonard Williams, that I think Chris would love him, is that they play, the Niners love to play games up front, and Mm -hmm. this guy's just exceptional. At, at that, holding as far too, as right? the TE stunts, TV stunts, the ET yeah. stunts, lining them up outside, having them loop inside, lining them up inside, loop them around. I just think that in this on this line, he could he could. Yeah, be that's quite, a great okay, fair he, enough. He could be great good. call, he could be good. great call. Uh, Leo says this and Papa Cone Zone are tied for my favorite. Jesse, could you bring Eric's points from last night's call in show into this discussion? Uh, I wish I could, Leo. I, I honestly don't remember what the points are. I took so many calls yesterday. Eric is a very good caller. Uh, Eric Dane, I believe is who you're talking about. Great caller. He always thinks outside the box, but I really honestly couldn't tell you what he brought up yesterday that you're referring to. Jesse's just here for the cash. He doesn't listen to you people. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) You're all just, you're like callers. We had a program director on the radio. He'd be like, the callers are fucking tools. All right. They're just tools. They'd be like, all right, all right, all right. But I, you, some of the hosts would like have relationships with the callers. Hey, I really like this guy. Hey, there, he's a goddamn tool. Like, all right, all right, easy, 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 Bob. Um, I, Brother Bob, I do. One thing yes. I wanted to add is Krug. I think the one thing you said about Kenny Moore that's right on for this entire discussion is, I don't think they're gonna trade for somebody merely to fulfill Depth some sort something. of obligation of, okay, now we have an extra defensive line. And if they do that, it's going to be a much younger developmental player that has a future on this team. If they trade for an expiring contract, that guy has to be able to start for them year one. And that, that and or not even year one, like t- 10 games into the season. And that doesn't leave a lot of names on the list for value. I love the Kenny Moore idea. That's yeah. a great idea. Just because he's, there are very few elite players in the secondary, and he's playing at a really high level right now. Uh, Brother Bob says, For multiple years. Uh, killing me, laughing my ass off. Definitive answers now. Okay. Brother Is Bob. that what those emojis mean? I don't know. Brother Bob, you're you're really pissing me off. Dazzo says, LK, you really taking BP over Herbert? Imagine Herbert on the Niners offense. I was noncommittal. No, no, yeah, I'd rather take Purdy. I'd rather have Purdy than Herbert. I don't. I, oh. I, I love, I love Herbert's arm, but there's something about Herbert I really don't like. No way. Are you for I real? I don't love Herbert, man. Herbert, oh. Herbert, Herbert is throws awesome, but he consistently comes up small in big moments. I mean, I, it, it looks accidental, but when you watch enough games, it's not accidental. I watched him but at didn't you Oregon. Say, wait, but didn't you say you haven't watched enough of him? But, I mean, I watched him at Oregon. I mean, I he this the same guy that I'm looking at now, I saw at Oregon. He looks awesome, but they don't win. They That's win. 
I mean, I don't know. I I understand that Herbert is a monster. Talent. Are you taking Jimmy? Okay, are you taking Jimmy over Herbert? What? No, Jimmy. He won. I Jimmy. He Jimmy won stinks. here. Jimmy's he won awful. here for years. I never liked Jimmy. Well, what's the distinction? You just said it's about winning, only winning. Jimmy won, but I mean, Jimmy. I, I don't. I don't like Jimmy. I don't like Jimmy. <laughs> Jimmy. Jimmy's greatest attribute was his ability to overcome his own mistakes. I was never in on Jimmy. Never. I never felt comfortable with Jimmy. I feel comfortable with Brock. I feel like Brock sees it. I never felt like Jimmy I do saw. too. I I mean, listen. I think Brock. I like is, Herbert's is talent, Jimmy, but but this isn't. Oh uh, my gosh! Over Herbert. I I love Herbert's talent. Don't get me wrong. I love Herbert's talent, but I don't believe in Herbert. There's something that makes me. I gotta see Herbert do it before. I mean, I gotta see him win some of these games. I, I, every time I watch him, they Come lose. On, you, you can't wait to see him do it. You got it. You got to put your stake in the road. <laughs> I would like to have Herbert, but I, I I think there's some special traits in Brock. Yeah. yeah okay. My reaction to your, your comment about you Herbert. over Herbert is you have a size thing. You love bad. guys who have good big big time size. I, is, I don't need them as, to fit into a box. Your remember your reaction to coach when he picked uh Tannehill over T Purdy. Remember you how, remember how blasphemous you thought that was? Yeah. I think what you just said is just as blasphemous. All right. Not I completely believe that. All right. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. Does not care. You're talking about a 500 quarterback right now. Not even. You're talking about a sub 500 quarterback. Um I just I I I I see what you like about Herbert. Herbert made a throw last year at Levi's. That was one of the greatest throws I've seen in the history of the stadium. That fourth down throw when he was backed up into his on his own like five and he threaded the needle on a post pattern between two defenders and he threw it on a frozen freaking rope. I mean, he makes some of the plays that, that you go, screw Mahomes, screw Allen, this is the guy. I mean, in some ways, Herbert is the biggest talent. He has huge talent. I just... There's something wrong there, and I can't put my finger on it. I don't know what it is. I mean, he's got weapons. I'll put like my finger weapons. on it. I'll put it, my finger on it. His name is first name is Brandon. His last name is Staley. Yeah, he's a terrible coach. <laughs> um. Okay, we got this one. Uh, Larry, how about Kenny Clark, defensive tackle, great run stopper? No way, no how. They're not move. There's no way Green Bay is going to move Kenny Clark to the Niners. You got to remember this. There's a couple teams that really don't want to see the Niners do well. The Raiders and the Packers are probably at the top of that list. They would rather take less to send their players other places than see the Niners win. James Foster Buckner fits the Hollywood film ending like for the 49ers. Too. DeForest? Yeah. Oh, that would be awesome. That one. What I would it cost? What would it cost? <laughs> I've... I don't know, but that would be great. Brother it's Bob Greenlaw. Happen, but I, would I mean, that's it. not going to. Greenlaw with a 15-yarder, Brother Bob. Wow, Purdy's pimp, you said you would take Herbert over Brock Purdy before. I know, I've changed my mind. I'm waffling. <laughs> I'm waffling. Dude, you can't do that. I'm a waffle. No, he saw two more games. The two games that you oh, need to that's see. That's right. He saw. Oh, right. He, he did. Yeah, he got yeah. from 15 to 17. Good for him. The key, the key is I'm not afraid to be wrong. You know, I, I I feel like I'll still have an audience, even if I'm wrong. But did you get to 17 or did you wait only at 15? Because if you do get to 17, then is there really credibility? That's, to your, rule. That? that's, that's your rule. My rule is I, I, I'll i call it early. I'll call it early. If I see it early, I'll call it early. Um, OK, uh, one more I got to get to here. Now, here we go. Um, Let me just put that aside. I want to share the screen. Thank you. I feel like I'm on uh, I'm on like uh, Wheel of Fortune. I'd like to buy a vowel. <laughs> I'd like Ooh, wait wait e. Larry 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 answer this super chat. Come on. God damn these super chats never end. Daza LK, you think the Chargers would be better if they had Brock Purdy? I don't care about the Chargers. Chargers suck. Chargers have uh, no fans. Chargers have no fans. <laughs> no true, city wants the Chargers. True. They have that one lady that's been going viral. Oh, yeah, yeah. They she's not actress. even a Charger fan. They have the actress. <laughs> yeah, that was, she's a fraud. <laughs> she is a fraud. All right, I'm going to share the screen here. She's like a Viking fan. Ooh, screen share. Two hours and 33 minutes into the show, you're sharing your screen, Larry? 
I, know, I don't like to. I, my parents used to tell me as a kid, I never liked to share. I know that's hard to believe. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, here's Shanny from earlier this week. This, this is he's being asked about Wilkes, and here's his answer. And I want to I want to finish the show with this one. Said after the game about your own zero blitz at the end of the first half, that it was something you discussed during the week. What what have those conversations been like with Steve Wilkes and? Where's your understanding about what you guys are trying to accomplish with that? Yeah, I think he, he knows you guys. I think talk to him tomorrow. Uh, he knows he messed up on that call. I have no problem with zero blitzes, um, um, especially when people need a lot of yards. You know, if you need to get 20 yards to kick a field goal, I have no problem with a zero blitz. Um, but I do when there's 16 seconds left, and I, that's where he lost track. There was no necessary need for that just because of the time. I have no problem with the call. Got to, but. I mean, I have no problem with that play call, but when it's that time, you can't do that. It's not an option. There's right. been an update to this, Larry, that What's I think that? needs to be. There's been an update to that that we need to probably also add for full context. Okay, go ahead. Is he said today also that he should have called the timeout before the play happened and changed the play, and he put well, that, that on himself. Did, you know, the one thing that did not come up and I didn't get a chance to ask it is Shanahan on the defensive headsets. Yeah, you should be. He's a coach. Well, you would think, but I mean, sometimes he's behind the bench talking to the players during the deep. Does I mean some offensive coaches? I, I know McV- uh, yeah, Sean you're McVay. Talking about McVay going and sitting on. Do you remember when he used to go sit on the Gatorade tub? Yeah, I mean, he let Wade Phillips have total autonomy. How much control does Steve have? Of these calls. Well, I'll tell you how much control he has. He didn't have the control to come in and implement Steve Wilkes' defense. He got to implement a defense that they evolved from the Seattle scheme that Shanahan specifically wanted to integrate the wide nine into the Seattle scheme. That was not a Salah idea. That was a Shanahan idea. And then this defense is what he philosophically believes it should be. So I, I don't think that's – I think while Steve Wilkes has autonomy to run the defense like any defensive coordinator does because Shanahan runs the offense like the quasi-coordinator along with being the head coach, I, I still think that at the end of the day, the buck stops with Shanahan. He's the guy that makes those kinds of decisions, and I think that in that moment, I don't think he ever expected Wilkes with 16 – once he saw that ball get checked down to Alexander Madison and they wasted the nine seconds, you got a running clock 16 seconds – I thought, I think he felt like that was a moment. All right, they're going to run this clock out. They got utterly no chance of scoring. Let me start looking forward into halftime. And then out of nowhere, my guy decides to call an all out blitz. And yeah, Mooney Ward should have picked that off. But Mooney Ward also shouldn't be left in a situation where it's him, the ball, the receiver. And if he messes up, it's a touchdown from six it's- yards away with 16 seconds and no timeouts. That's utterly ridiculous, regardless of how the play resulted. The call was ridiculous. The call, no, I, and I agree. And I said it, I said it on the post game show. And I you know I don't need Shanahan or anybody else to tell me that that was a ridiculous call to know that's a ridiculous call. The, there's one thing that I talked about in the post game. I said risk versus reward. That's why that's a ridiculous call because the risk is great. The reward was nothing. And then it wasn't a bad call solely. It was a bad call played also poorly by the defensive back. Are you here for your own stats? Are you here to win games? Because the, the deflection is just as effective there as the interception. So what are you selling out for the interception for and letting the man get behind you? when you should have played that more conservatively and go for the deflection. The deflection has the exact same impact. You're you're trotting to the locker room and you're getting orange slices and you know what I mean? And you're down 3. Or if he completes it I, I think that's it, a little harsh. Or or if he completes it? No, no, because if he completes it, they get a field goal maybe? Okay. Then let then now you're down 6. But you can't let him get 6. Okay. That fair. was a big misplay by by Mooney Ward. It's not about your pick. It's about having the right awareness to make the right play for your team. And that was too much too much risk versus reward for Wilkes. Too much risk versus reward for Ward. Oh, reward versus Ward. By uh, the way, it's said. Anyway, too much risk versus reward there. And um, that's why it was a bad call. Now, there's two other cuts of this that I, I need to get you 
your guys' thoughts on. I'm going to share the screen again. Here is Wilkes today. And Wilkes came into the room, and he tried to kind of preempt it and be like, hey, I want to look ahead. I don't want to look back by kind of owning it. Listen to Wilkes and the way he falls on the on the sword here. Really interesting. Very prideful guy, but he I this is what he had to say. With you. Uh, by the time I talk to you guys, uh, win or lose mentally, uh, I'm on to the next game. And um, I know there's a lot of questions about the uh, call right before the half. Uh, so I definitely want to address that before I move on to uh, Cincinnati. Uh, take full responsibility uh, for that call. Um, I have to do a better job in putting the guys in a better position. Uh, we have good players. I know that and uh, can't really press the issue. You know, uh, and with that, you know, moving forward, uh, it's my responsibility to do that. So uh, I, you know, wish I could take it back. Um, but uh, again, you know, uh, I got to I got to do. better. So uh, this week, moving forward, I would say we have a uh, definitely a challenge ahead of us. Um, Joe Burrow, in my opinion, is one of the. All right. Well, that well, that's the only part we need to show on that. But then I asked. Um, Chris Forster. So after Wilkes, you know, and I felt I asked Wilkes a couple questions. You know, at this point, he's admitted that he made a mistake. The 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 head coach has has, has dragged him right publicly. Yeah, and I want to talk about that. Um, and it was very odd. You don't these guys cover each other, and it seemed really odd that Shanahan would use such strong terminology as messed up. Right? I mean. Um, hey, that's, you know, there's other ways to say that. Hey, you know, yeah, we didn't, it's not what, we, it's not necessarily what we wanted there. It's another way of saying he should have done something else, but to come out and say he messed up. I, I just don't, I don't think you, I've never, I don't hear that. I've never heard coaches, um, throw another coach under the bus like that. Um, in, in a public setting, it was, to me, it was unbelievable that Shanahan went there, but I want to share the screen one more time. And I asked because I didn't want to ask Wilkes about it because it seemed so deeply personal and he's such a, such a uh, good guy. And he's not just a good guy. He's a prideful guy. And it's like, he already owned it. But I mean, I was, I, and I felt like asking him, how did you think, feel about the verbiage that Shanahan used there to describe it? And, but I didn't want to, you know, I didn't want to belabor it that much more. So then Forster comes in next. Okay. And I asked Forster, who's a longtime yeah. NFL coach, about this play and how Kyle kind of went into it. You Maybe you can hear my question here, and then you can hear Forster. Here we go. Kyle came out and said that Steve messed up a call on the podium. How does that sit with coaches when when a coach apps, you know, criticizes you publicly? Great question. Directly. Is that just part of the territory? Is that something easy to deal with, hard to deal with? It is for me. I mean, I'm. I, it's easy to me. It's. It's. It is what it is. <clears throat> the hardest thing is, is you can't. You say, well, nobody really understands when you say that because you really don't know. It's hard to explain to people that aren't inside working it every single day. It's. It's a. It's a very. You know, there's a lot that goes into it. But in the same sense, you can't hide and say, well, there's nothing wrong. And, and so you just admit it and you live with it and you understand that the court of public opinion is going to be what it's going to be. And some will understand and have a good understanding of what you're talking about. Others won't. And that comes with the territory with the job. You know, the more people sit out here the more people fill those stadiums uh the more people internet all the things that go on with it i know that one thing's happened through the course of that time is salaries have gone up and uh with that salary comes the the you you have to take the heat for for the job that you do and you have to stand and be accountable for the things that you do um because there is more people and there are more people interested there are more people that are analyzing you on television and radio and everywhere else and it comes with the territory man it's what it is and and you have to understand that you know you control what you control and what you do control is the job that you do and whether somebody appreciates the job you do or doesn't and when the head coach if he wants to stand up and say the offensive line didn't play well enough he's the head coach he's in charge and, and that's does it bother me? You didn't play well enough. So there you go. And I just thought, you know, one, I felt kind of weak asking Forster that, to be totally honest, guys, because I I wanted to ask that question to Wilkes, but then I kind of felt like that's, that's I don't know, just seemed like you'd be piling on Wilkes because he already kind of owned the mistake. And, you know, how does it feel when the, you know, but, but give me your thoughts on all of it because, um, it's, it seemed out of character. It seemed a little odd. Usually these guys are covering each other. 
Um, but Shannon, and then we had somebody suggest that the front office is dissatisfied with Wilkes. I don't, I haven't seen those reports, so I, I, there's nothing I can say to that, but I thought it was really interesting hearing Chris's thoughts because he's also a veteran coach and the way he kind of, um, yeah, G Martinez's Krug had mercy on Wilkes. I, I do like Wilkes. I really do. And I just felt like, you know, uh, he'd had enough. You know what I mean? It was like you know he was getting beat on, and uh, you could see the the pain that he was he had in his face there. Um, and he kind of knew that he screwed up, and he got raked by the head coach publicly. And um, I'm just kind of wondering. I mean, I believe in accountability too. And heck, I had a, guys in the in the Canadian league called me "F you, Larry" the whole year. And if I made a mistake, um, you know, I got dragged for it. And there's and and he said, hey, look, the salaries are up, going up. In other words, this thing's big now. Everybody cares. Everybody's watching. It's all out there. And there's internet. And there's YouTube. And there's everything else. Radio, television. And you got to be accountable. And I'm cool with it. And the head coach, he wants to call me out. He can. And these guys call out their players. So if the players get called out by the coaches, why shouldn't the assistant coaches get called out by the uh, head coach? And why shouldn't the head coach get called out by the owner? I mean, doesn't everybody have to be accountable? But did Kyle cross the line to you guys? And do you think that there's going to be fallout from that? Um, what, give me your, and I respect the hell out of you guys. You guys observe this as much as anybody and and have a good about, a good sense of it. What What is your take on the way Kyle dealt with the problem and then Steve's reaction to it? And then, Forster's kind of perspective on it. I think that it was a bad play call. It was a, ba a bad time to make that play call. So let's get that out of the way. I, I agree on that. I love that he took accountability in front of the media, Wilkes. I don't necessarily have a problem with Kyle calling it out and being honest if he didn't have a way to stop it from happening. And he did. I mean, he was on the headset. And that's where I have the issue is like, okay, you could have stopped this from happening. And when I when I said this yesterday, a lot of people gave me pushback. Well, I mean, you know, what, what if he's talking to the offense? Or what if he's, okay. But you had two timeouts. You could have called the timeout. You knew what was coming. Everybody was watching like, okay, there's a blitz coming. Very likely here. You could have called the timeout. So I, I thought that was a little, I don't know, Forrester might be fine with being called out, but that doesn't mean that Wilkes is. Everybody's different. Everybody, uh, and as a leader, you have to know who's okay with that and who's not. Maybe Wilkes is okay with it, and it, this is not a big deal, but maybe he's not. And maybe he feels like, hey, man, like, it's kind of demeaning. You know what I mean? Like, I'm here running your choice of defense. I acquiesce to that. I've been in this league for a long time, too. Like, it's a bit disrespectful. Or he may not think anything of it. He may be fine. But I do like that Shanahan also did come out afterwards and say, you know what, ultimately, I should have called the timeout. I knew what was happening in that moment. I had two timeouts. I should have called the timeout. Yeah, you should have called the timeout. And none of this, none of this would have happened at all. None of it. So that was a missed opportunity by Wilkes with the bad play call. And it was a missed opportunity by Kyle to not stop it in the moment, knowing he didn't feel comfortable with it, knowing he's the head coach and knowing he had two timeouts, he should have called the timeout and stopped it from happening as well. Yeah. I, I kind of have a similar, but not the same exact perspective. Um, I think that Shanahan's answer today should have been his initial answer and answer after the game. I thought there were a couple parts that were particularly weird about it, including one when he said, Oh, you guys are going to be talking to Steve Wilkes as if, he was just leaving Steve Wilkes out to dry to answer this question. Shanahan's the head coach of this team. He takes accountability when things go wrong. He's the first person that should take accountability for it. And whether he does that internally, whether he does that externally is somewhat irrelevant to me. I cannot speak on how this did or didn't affect his relationship with Steve Wilkes. But I do think the way he went about it was a little bit weird, especially given that he had culpability in what happened. Um the one thing I will say about what Forrester said, I think Forrester just gave perspective on how coaches last in this business and what their mindset needs to be. That doesn't necessarily mean 
that that perspective is correct in terms of they being that means then criticizing them publicly is fair. I guess my biggest issue was Steve Wilkes had to come out like a martyr for the loss. Yes, that was a terrible call. There's no excuses for the call. That call was not the only reason that lost the 49ers that football game, right? I, I didn't see Christian McCaffrey had to come out and issue a public apology for fumbling in the red zone. I didn't see Mooney Ward have to come out and issue a public apology for dropping an interception into Jordan Addison's hands. You know what I mean? I didn't see anybody else have to issue, like Greg Greenlaw, Fred Warner. These are high-level players. Missed tackle after tackle in that football game. It feels like Steve Wilkes is dying on the sword for it. And it was a terrible call. Um, but ultimately, I, I I don't think that he needed to be the one that had to come and take public accountability and all. And that's kind of my only issue from it from that standpoint. It seems anyway like he had moved on from it. He addressed it and went on to answer questions about Cincinnati. Shanahan then made the correct statement today. I, I think that that's about it that there is to that situation. My only main issue was Shanahan directing it like, oh, you can ask Wilkes question tomorrow. They're not equals. He's his superior. He doesn't do the, oh, you can just ask questions to Wilkes about it. He's the manager. When we talk to Steve Wilkes and we're not getting a satisfactory answer, we go to the, we say, let's talk to the manager. And the manager is Kyle Shanahan. He's the guy in charge. He should have an answer for what the guy under him is doing, not vice versa. I'll, I'll give you my perspective on it. I've seen, you know, I used to work in pro football in the Canadian League and in the NFL, but in the Canadian League, I was quality control. And so we, I would sit, I was a defensive quality control coach. So I would sit with the defensive coordinator the linebacker coach, the secondary coach, the defensive coordinator was the D-line coach, um, or I was the linebacker coach, I should say. So the linebacker coach slash defensive coordinator, the D-line coach, and the secondary coach, and me, would sit there and watch the film. And we would go through all kinds of every aspect of, of the thing. It would take hours and hours and hours. Um, three or four times a fist fight broke out in the middle of the film film session where the linebacker coach said, man, that was on the DBs. And the DB coach said, no, 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 that was on the linebackers. And essentially they're blaming each other mm. and fist flying dip cups and stuff flying and blows being thrown and bloody lips. And I mean, it, it you know, and at the time I was 25 years old and I was like, whoa, you know, this is not your typical workplace environment. And I remember talking to the guys, in, you know, we were calm after these fights, you know, we're joking around. Now we're over it because we would always, you know, fight it out, talk it out. Um, but I mean, literal brawls breaking out and, um, and they would say, Hey man, this is an IBM. You know, this is not a corporate world. Oh, just taking a shot at the tech guys, huh, Larry? <laughs> they were just saying, is. like, okay, this isn't okay. a this isn't a corporate America. And you know what? There's something really refreshing about um having it out. I mean, there's something really healthy about having it out. Now, it's not is it healthy? You would never have it, you would never brawl in corporate America. But in, but you might have resentment that builds up over time. When you do fight it out, and you do, and you're really blue, brutally honest with each other, and there's no nothing left unsaid. You know what? It's it's a you know it's kind of the way football is. I mean, the 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 players, the the coaches are direct with the players. Direct. You f this up. They may not say it that way, but they may say it that way. Um, the, the coaches are direct with the players. The head coach is direct with the assistant, with the coordinators. The coordinators are direct with the defensive coaches. If it's a defensive coordinator or offensive coaches, if it's the offensive coordinator, direct pointed, um, borderline dysfunctional, but no ambiguity about what the points are. And it's just kind what? of a, it's a tough world. And it's like in that world, in their world, it's it's healthy to call it out. Now, do you need to say messed it up in front of the media? That's the part. It's like the verbiage. 
you know, um, that's a little bit because like Steve's got to command the room. And if you call him out, you know, in front of the media, the players also hear that and see that. And does he lose face with his players because the co head coach calls him out? I don't think so. I think at the end of the day, it really just shows them that he has to be accountable for what he does and they have to be accountable for what they do and something that they do wrong ultimately could get him yelled at. And it's a very powerful thing. Bill Walsh, when he would yell at players, he would say, and Bubba Paris told me this former Niner offensive lineman that when, but when, when Bill Walsh was mad at Bubba, instead of saying, Bubba, you need to do this. He would say, Hey, McKittrick, can't you get Bubba to do that any better? And the full and, and the that kind of reverse mindset actually is a motivator because you as the player don't want to see your coach yelled at for something that you caused. And so Bubba told me, hey man, I never I always wanted to be the best I could be because I didn't want McKittrick to get yelled at by Walsh because of my ass. And in a lot of ways, Wilkes is wearing now. This is a call that's directly on him. But it kind of tells the players, hey, we have total and utter accountability in this in this organization. And you can call it dysfunctional or you can call it healthy. It is what it is. And we're going to have it out. And nobody's above the blame and nobody's above being questioned to their face directly. Um, and there's no, there's no sacred cows. But, but so I think it's and I, in the end, in the weird way I think it's actually good doing it publicly and that's what I wanted to get to because yeah, I feel publicly, like okay, yeah all of that happens behind closed doors I think there's an understanding for all of us that it's there we never see this get out publicly where a coach goes yeah ask the defensive coordinator about that call usually they go even if they even if it's a situation where you ask the defensive coordinator about that call they say you know what whatever happened it's on me it's a bad call. Let's move along. Instead, Shanahan was like, yeah, I didn't know what he was doing. Like, ask you can ask him. Like, he obviously messed that up. That was well, his hey, first. But don't you think that action. shows, Vish, that he gives Wilkes autonomy? And maybe he won't going forward, but that he give, gives his. I get the picture that no, Shanahan's but, but like no, a czar of the offense it, it and gives his defense coordinator he's not, autonomy. He's not. He's him and Steve Wilkes aren't equal. That's the problem with that autonomy. It gives the impression that him and Steve Wilkes are 50-50 CEOs of this company. Shanahan is the 100% CEO and manager of this business. If yeah. you own a business, you're the manager and I'm your assistant. You can give me autonomy to do whatever I want publicly. But at the end of the day, it is not Larry Kruger and Vish Kumar and owner of this business. It's Larry Kruger, owner of this business. Whatever happens in the business, it comes down to Larry Kruger, not me or not Wilkes in this case. And that's where I think it was a little unbecoming of Shanahan to do that. Do you think there's fallout guys? No. This Some people seem to think that there will really be. Well. No, no, there could be. I mean, there could, I don't know. Like I said, it all depends on Wilkes personality. I mean, maybe Wilkes is the type, like I said, that could be totally fine with this. I don't know. Maybe he's not. Yeah. Not sure. What'd you think of the way he handled it though? He was like, Hey, look, I, he owned it. But then he also tried to like steer it to this week and not want to look back. And then he got several questions about it, even despite the way he kind of fired that opening salvo with, hey, I own it. He still had follow up questions. I mean, do you think he yeah. do you, should there have been follow up questions or should he should the media have just said, you know fair. what? Look, I, I'm not the, I am not that guy that thinks that the media should throw up softball questions and not ask these guys anything or not put any pressure on them. But it's, a, you know, it's up to the coaches or players to say, hey, you know, next question, or you know what, I'm not answering that. Or I'm going to give you a canned answer. But your, your guys' job in the media is to ask those tough questions. It just is. So it's all fair. I think the questions are totally fair. I don't think he has to continue to answer them once he takes accountability and he says he's on, he can be like, I already answered that. I, let's talk about the Bengals. I already yeah. answered that. Let's talk about that. You know, that's how he could have addressed it. So, but I think it is totally fair to ask the question. Yes. All right, guys. Good stuff. Um, 
almost really three hours. We're right here at three hours. It's uh, one a.m. Eastern, so we probably should let Jesse get on. Our, you know, I, you know. I just wanted to say, um, great stream. I enjoyed it. Um, thank you to everybody. Thanks to all the. Well, I like to thank the sponsors: MarinAutoglass.com, New York Style Italian Sausage, Pig and a Pickle, the best barbecue in all of Northern California. And um, today's stream also brought to you by Mojo Fantasy. Uh, click, check that link in the description. Make sure you use the promo code Krug. You can save up to $100 on your first deposit. And also, everybody who enters at mojofantasy.com automatically is in the uh, raffle to win a, a Nick Bosa and or a Brock Purdy jersey on Thanksgiving night after our postgame show after Niners Seahawks from Seattle. Um, so check that out, mojofantasy.com. Great new uh, fantasy website. Uh, they do great stuff, and we appreciate them sponsoring the Krug Show as well. Guys, final thoughts. Um, we're not going to talk again until after the trade deadline, so this is going to be kind of an eventful few days. It's not just Niners Bengals Sunday. It's Niners Bengals Sunday, and then I think the trade deadline's Tuesday maybe. Yeah, so then Halloween. Lynch will. Yeah, so Lynch will. Uh, will you guys dress up on Halloween? No, uh, but my kids will, and I'll take them trick or treating. What do you, uh, Jesse? You, the way you said no, it's almost like you have disdain for people who dress up. Um, <laughs> is there an age limit where you feel like you should no, no longer dress up? I think it depends. If you're an adult <laughs> and you're attending adult an adult party around Halloween, then sure you can dress up. But um, I'm 40, and my kids go trick or treating, <laughs> and I'm not dressing up. So. <laughs> <laughs> I once worked in this company where we did sales and this guy shows up um, in like a total Dracula thing with blood coming down his in the fake teeth and the whole deal. I go, dude, you realize you're not selling shit today. You do the, you, you do realize nobody's going to buy anything from Dracula. You know that, right? And he's like, well, it's, you know, I'm just getting in the spirit Krug and all this stuff. Um, that always cracks me up and it always cracks me up. You know, when, you know, that, that quiet, like the quiet lady at work, suddenly she's a naughty nurse. On, <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah, you know, deep down, I think you really are the naughty nurse. Vish, <laughs> will you be dressing up on Halloween? No, I will not be. Come on, Vish. No. Not even you need, not we dress up those walls for Halloween so that there's something behind they're you other up, than an they're oscillating They're decorated family. for Halloween right now. Oh, okay, perfect. All right. Yeah. Do you live in a neighborhood where trick-or-treaters will come by? Either of you. Yes. Uh, if they come by my apartment building, I'm a take one, leave it outside. Whatever lucky kid gets to dump that into their pillowcase. God bless them. Really? You, you, you you don't have the exchanges. Oh, what are you? And then and no, place no, them in the I, so I live in an apartment building, right? So it's, that's not really okay, so, so fun. Like, when I, awesome. if I'm back at home, like around the neighborhood subdivision, I do like doing that. I like seeing the kids come by. I like tossing them a couple extra of the good candy. Being that guy, you know, throwing whatever weird kid uh, milk duds or dots if I know them purposefully just because it's like, yeah, here you go. I'm giving you the bad stuff so that I can be mooching on the uh, good stuff while I'm waiting, handing out candy. But I, really, like I like the milk duds and the dots. Oh, geez. I, I'd be I'd be like, hey, Are man, you that a guy's Whoppers awesome. guy too. Whoppers. Is no, tough. I don't like the Whoppers. I don't like Whoppers. They're all terrible. I'm 100 grand is one of my favorites. Swedish fish. Um, fish is awesome. The sour strings, you know, those are pretty good. Um, I'm the guy who, you know, the kid that grabs a ton, I'm like, oh, oh, and then the kid who grabs only one, I get get a gigantic handful and just drop it in his bag. Good, nice. You know, nice. I'm, the, I'm like Robin Hood. You know, I steal from the rich and give to the poor. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, what was I going to say, uh, Jesse? Uh, you know, don't I? I know you're not this guy. But how do you feel about the person that puts like fruit, um, like an apple or like yeah. stuff that's clearly not candy? I mean, if you don't have candy, just keep your door, keep your, you know, turn off the light and, and move on to the next night. Don't try giving people what's in the cupboard. He He's yeah. The, the guy that's like, you know what? My one apple is going to override a whole pillowcase <laughs> full of candy. I'm making sure that these kids are going to be healthy. Like, no, bro, don't. Do no, that. no, no. If you don't got candy, give it up. And Quack says raisins. No, fuck raisins. Don't. Yeah, raisins. Nobody, are wants, nobody wants your goddamn raisins. All right. Damn it. <laughs> <laughs> this is good, too. Uh, Joey Nichols. I hand out spinach leaves to the kids. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, great. And don't give away brushes, Joey Nichols toothbrushes. Yeah. <laughs> toothbrushes, dude. You know what's so funny about Halloween? As a kid, they always warn you don't take candy from strangers, and the entire thing of Halloween is taking. Is candy that? From yeah, yeah, strangers. yeah. Seriously, uh, I, I remember running around sweating in those masks, and, and you're feeling like ass because you're munching all this candy, and you're. I mean, think about it too. It's like the worst time of the year. You can barely see these kids. And they're stepping off curbs and oh man. Anyway. <laughs> you got two super chats, by the way. Uh I'll get to them. Victor Garcia says Krug saying fuck raisins is the best. Krug, I, I I'm gonna have to take a bathroom break while you get to those. Really? If I look at you. <laughs> look at him nice. Look at that nice haircut Vish had once upon a time. He looks so young. Lee, <laughs> there's a man who had eaten a lot of raisins. <laughs> uh Leo R says Eric was talking about how players don't forget to be good. And we had a top three defense the last few years, over blitzing, leaving the whole hole, mm. leaving holes in the D. A uh, team scheming against it, and our D line can't get home. Yeah, yeah. So, so this was from the call last night. He was going back to it. Oh, yeah, I got okay, you. okay. So, yeah, absolutely. And I do, I agree with him. I mean, it it is clear that the defensive line is getting close, but they're not able to finish the job, and a lot of that is because they're. They are. They're playing soft coverage, and they're allowing things to go underneath. Wilkes, it's interesting because I agree with Vish that he's essentially running Shanahan's defense and what he prefers, but it almost seems like the back half, he's doing his own thing. So he's like, all right, I will run your wide nine and do everything you want to do with the front seven, but I'm the secondary guy. Let me do it the way I want to. And those two things just don't go together. They don't. What if I told you that a couple of weeks ago, Jesse, I asked Steve if Chris controls the games up front or if he does, my guess was Chris controls the games up front. Mm. I was wrong. He says he does. So maybe that's the issue. Maybe Chris knows what games he wants to play up front. Maybe Steve is not picking the right time or the right combination of games. I mean, he discusses it with Chris. It's not like Chris is not in the discussion, but so much of how effective the games that you play up front are are predicated on when you do it, as opposed to what exactly the game is. Um, I just kind of wonder. creativity up front, and I talked about this in the post-game Sunday. It just seems like there's, I mean, where's the stunts? Where's the movements? Where You know what I mean? There's just... I, it's like, okay, we're going to get home with four, but we're going to line up with four and rush from the same spot every time. We're not we're not going to do any twists or stunts or move Why not move around. Bosa around a little bit? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Bosa Bosa's great, but if you can get him to stunt be That was like one of the things that excited me the most was him playing next to Hargrave. I'm like, oh, man, can we get a little bit of a, of a Smith-Smith throwback with these two where... You know, Hargrave's taking on the double team and then Bosa's looping around and getting home and vice versa. We haven't seen any of that stuff. Um, somebody's saying Capri Suns when you're <laughs> <laughs> it's prime, it's prime now. Kids love prime, man. They like go crazy over that stuff. <laughs> we get this one. He's not a super, but he's just uh age lamb eighty eight. <laughs> Larry, are you giving out New York style sausage for Halloween? That's not yes. Would you like some chorizo? <laughs> yeah, come on, get in here, everybody. Get your chorizo. <laughs> oh, that's beautiful. And we got this one from Daza. He said there seems to be a lot of criticism of Wilkes. Shouldn't shouldn't uh, shouldn't be a critique of Shanahan for only putting up forty one points over the last two games. It's so funny that Daza says that because that was one of my questions I was going to say today to Wilkes, which was, hey. Steve, how do you feel about the way your defense is playing? Your, um, you know, you 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 gave up 19 points and 22 points the last two weeks and lost. Your defense gave up 23 points in week two to the Rams, but won. How do you grade your defense? I mean, isn't it isn't it partially on the offense? You know, to see what he would say. But then it seemed kind of combative, especially since like you're kind of like leaning him down towards the throne a shot back at Kyle. Yeah, like I'm yeah. like, you know, I I'm, I'm, I'm leading the guy to the guillotine. You know, it's like, why don't it. you rip your boss? Yeah, I, I get it. This this is a, a real thing. 
you know, the defense has given up 20.5 points per game. If we were to take a season average and where that ranks in the league, that puts them dead middle of the league, 16th in the league. So we are accustomed to this defense being a top three defense, a top one defense, but they gave up 20.5 points, which is dead center in the league. In contrast, the offense has only scored 17 points each of the last two weeks. That would place them, I th- I can't remember, I, 26th or 28th. Yeah, well, the I Bengals think. right now average 16.7 points, and they're 28th. Okay, so 27th in the league is where it's going to place them. Roughly, so yeah. 27th is worse than 16th. So, you know, they deserve some blame too. Well, and on the year, the Niners have allowed 15.6 points per game. That's third in the league. Mm-hmm. The Niners have scored 28.7. That's second in the league. Mm-hmm. So for the year, they're both doing damn well. And um, the offense has taken the bigger back step the last two weeks than the defense, according, you know, if we're going to who's taking the bigger slide as far as rankings, it would be the offense. There's a lot of people that believe, and, you know, this is where, you know, this might be another topic for another show. There's a lot of people that believe that Kyle Shanahan can't take criticism and that um, that he's not good at taking credit, being self-reflective on criticism. I used to think that, but then, man, he really did own it on the Trey Lance thing when he said, I failed Trey, you know, and he kind of owned that criticism, like almost more so than he probably needed to, as far as why Trey failed. He didn't, there was no ambiguity or I didn't want this. He was like, I felt like I failed him. And I thought he was going to, going to cry up on the stage. I mean, he just seemed like he seemed very sincere when he, when he took the blame for that. But that I would say is the exception more than the rule. Um, I don't know that he takes um, criticism. Great. Um, I don't know if that's a great strength of his, but he did take it for the trade draft choice. So it's not like he can't take criticism, but um, I don't know. I don't know. It just seemed, it seemed weird when you have the defense was disappointing, but the offense was disappointing, Mm -hmm. you know? I, I don't even think it's that as much. It's just the fact that on Thursday, he's still answering questions about that makes it feel like that came only came down to that call. Yeah. All right, guys. Um, somebody said, oh, oh, marginal. I agree. Oh, original. 115. Says, Go to morning. sleep, guys. I know. I well, be up five in hours. Well, four hours and 45 minutes. I got to be up. I have to be up. Take too. my kids to school. See, look at that. Look yeah, what I've got done. a couple. I got a couple of done Friday to meetings, dude. It's kind of annoying, actually. I, <laughs> I, like, I had some days where I used to have no Friday meetings. All right, guys. Good stuff. Thanks to all of you. Thanks to everybody in the chat. Have a great night, everybody. Uh, thanks for supporting the Krug Show. If you haven't already signed up, go sign up for Last Second Sports. Go sign up for Vicious Channel as well. They do great content. Respect these guys immensely. Have a great night. Peace. Yeah, never met a man I've been scared of. Careful.